Hello everyone and welcome to you in my Python the Ultimate All-in-One course. Together we are going to have an amazing journey exploring one of the most famous and most job demanding programming language, which is Python. With this Ultimate course, you will learn everything that Python can do with detailed step-by-step -step tutorials suitable for any total programming beginner all the way to senior programmers. With tens of amazing hands-on real-life projects, this material will never go boring or dry. And when I tell you that you will learn everything in one course, I really mean everything. From the basics of Python language, scripting, to image and video processing, data analysis, machine learning, web design, automation, games, and even GUI interfaces meaning that you will learn all of those big words that you hear around the industry. This course is so dense that usually it is divided to multiple courses, but not in our course, you will master everything here with me. You will not need anything else to become ready for the hot job market. Let me now give you a very small summary on what projects we are going to implement together. We will learn how to handle all sorts of files like Excel files, PDFs, and text files. We will also learn how to process those files to extract important information. Not only that, we will learn how to convert scanned documents, for example, into text, build web-based machine learning applications that can be accessed anywhere in the world. We will also build email and SMS spam detectors, and we will build a very cool program that is going to distinguish between images which contains objects in them. Also, if you have a boring job, we are going to learn how we can automate it using Python famous libraries like Selenium, so that you will never have to do your boring job again, and Python scripts is going to take care of all of that for you. One of the most famous aspects of this course is actually that we are going to break data science into a very simple, easy to digest information. It's like explaining to a five years old how a certain algorithm works. This oversimplification is going to help you overcome the barrier between you and data science. In this course, we have a huge focus on machine learning, deep learning, and data analysis. We will be analyzing tons of datasets obtained from around the internet and we are going to draw cool insights about those data that we have collected and even predict future insights without actually having to have a travel machine in order to predict those events it's just with the pure data science there isn't any level of programming required to start this course there is no specific academic background because I'm going to be taking you step by step from ground to become a professional Python programmer. So what are you waiting for? Let's get this long journey together started. Hello guys and welcome to you in this course. In this lecture, we are going to see how we can download and set up all of our tools. Basically, we will be using Anaconda which is a distribution for Python and the R programming language. We will basically use it for Python. This distribution is supported by Windows, Linux, or even Mac OS. So let's get started, see how we can install it, and see how we can open the IDE that we will use initially to program Python. The first thing you need to do is just type on Google Anaconda Python and you should get this website which is called Anaconda Distribution. Click on it and then here you should see all the supported operating systems. For me it's saying that here for Windows so I can click on download directly and it will download the version that is suitable for my Windows. Initially it is 64 bits, I'm using Python 3.9, the newest version, at the moment I am recording this lecture. If you click on any of those, be it Mac OS or Linux, you should be able to get it for those operating systems as well. So for me here, I'm going to be clicking on download, and it will start downloading. 
Now this version is actually suitable for both 32 and 64 bits windows. Now I can open my installer. And you just need to follow the instructions. You don't really to do anything special. So say I agree, all users, just choose your setup directory and finalize this setup. And this will be the first step, which is installing the Anaconda Python distribution. Now that we have installed Anaconda, we are ready to open our IDE. An IDE is the editor that you are going to use in order to run your code. Any programming language, be it C, C++, Python, each has its own set of IDEs or editor. So let's see what we are going to use for this course. We will be using two editors. One of them is called Spider and the other one is called Jupyter Notebook. At the initial stage, we will be using only Spider. Then we will be switching between Jupyter Notebook and Spider along the way because each one is suitable for certain applications. Now let's see how we can open our Spider IDE. You need to press the Windows Start button and type Anaconda Prompt. Now Anaconda Prompt is a command line very similar to the command line that comes along with Windows. But this one actually comes along with Anaconda distribution. So let's open it. Now the command line will open. All you need to type is Spider like that. And to run this command by pressing enter. Now the IDE is initializing. All right, so this is our IDE, the spider IDE. Now we will write our code here and after we are done, we will be pressing this run file button and the code will be executing. You can save all of your files by just clicking on file and then save as, and then you can simply just choose a directory to store your Python program. And that's it. Now we are ready to start coding some Python. So let's get started. In the next couple sections, we will be preparing and installing our tools and environment to start programming with Python. Then we will be talking about the most basic Python functions like variables, user input, and of course, random number generators. This simple section will help you break the first barrier between you and programming. At the end, we will be building a very simple command line game to warm up and apply what we have learned. I'm really excited to start this journey with you guys, so let's get started. So let's dig into our first tutorial. The first one, we're going to talk about variables. If you ever took any math class, you would know about variables. We used to say in school something like x plus y could equal to z, right? Or we could say a plus b plus c is equal, let's say, to z, okay? There was multiple types of equations. And we could fill these letters with numbers. So we would say 1 plus 2 plus 3 is equal to z so one being a two being b and three being c and the result here if we just sum them up will be six right this is what variables is about we can write equations or store numbers in variables now those are all variables if you take a look at here at here all of those are variables Actually, if we are in Python, variables would be written the opposite way. So we would be saying z is equal to x plus y. Or we could say z is equal to a plus b plus c. And those could have values in them. Okay. Now, in programming, you cannot just say z equals a plus b plus c without first defining what is the value of a and b and c. So it was, it's going to be something like that. a is equal to 2, b is equal to 3, c is equal to 6, 
then we would say a plus b plus c is equaling to z like that okay so this is the way we can write variables now there are multiple types of variables that we can use for example we have integers so we have the integers and they are like one two three four minus one one hundred etc then we have something like floats okay or we call them sometimes doubles and they are decimal numbers like 1.1 .1, 2.5 0.3 minus 0.7 etc all the decimals are floats then we have strings and strings are letters like s z we need to put them in double quotation marks e and so on so forth Okay, so those are our main variable types. Let's go and dig into some code. So right now we have opened our IDE and we are ready to type our first code. Let us define a few variables like A is equal to 5, B is equal to 3, and C is equal to 2. Then we could say Z is equal to A plus B plus C. Okay, now we can go and hit on run file. And here in this screen, we will see the output, but currently we are not printing out anything. Yes, inside the memory, we have all of these variables stored and calculated. But if we want to see everything here in the terminal, we would say print, open a parenthesis, and simply just print whatever you want to print. In our case, it's Z. Run. And we can see here that it's 10. That is correct. Now, let's say I want to print other variables, like I want to print uh, A, I want to print B, and I want to print C. If I do that, I will see that 10, 5, 3, 2. This is exactly what I want. Now, let's say I want to print this whole formula like that, okay? So, I want to say Z is equal to 10, A is equal to 3 to 5, B is equal to 3, but I want to print it like here. I mean, right now, if I read this, I really don't know to which variable each number here is corresponding. So, to do that, we can just do the following. Inside the print, if you open a quotation mark, you will be writing your own message. And if you put a comma, you would be putting your variable. You will be printing out your variable. So, here, you'll write your a message then the variable will be displayed next to it regardless of its value so in my case my z is equal to okay now if i copy this whole thing and do it for every one of them here here and here and i only change z to a b and c if we hit on run we would see my z is 10 my a is five my b is three and my c is two okay now let us continue how about we clear this out and see the types of variables we can have so as i said we can have an integer a is an integer equaling to one b is a float equaling to 2.5 and c is a string equaling let's say to my string okay now let's say for example z is equal to a plus b and let's print z what value would i get as you can see it has added the integer value with the float value directly well that's good that's really good now we can also print the string print c and as we can see here it is printing my string so variables hold values Okay, all of those are values and all of those are variables. So right now, let us talk about user input. Why would we need to use user input? So let's say you want to give the variables yourself by typing them instead of coding them. So, so far we were writing codes like A equals 3, B equals 7. What if I want to run the program 
then I want to give the value of A and B. Well, in order to do that, we need to use an input. Uh, the input function is going to take the user input and then it's going to store it in a variable. Something like that. Let's say you want to put the value of Z. You would say Z is equal to input and then you would write your message like enter value and that's it. Now, once you execute this, you'll get this message displayed, enter value, and then you will have the chance to input any number or letter you want, and whatever you input is going to be stored here. So if you say here, let's say you've written 5, what's going to happen is z is going to equal to 5. Let us execute this. Now, let us code what we have written previously. So let's say we have a variable called z, and this z is going to equal to input. And we open a parenthesis. And we're going to say enter your name. And let's give a meaningful name here. So I'm going to say this is called name. And let's say next we're going to have the age. So this is my age. Enter your age. Okay, then I'm going to be printing the following. We're going to say my age is, remember, we put the message here, then we put a comma, and we put the variable, which is name. Now, whatever we have written here as a user input, it's going to be replaced here and displayed. Same thing here. This is name. And this is age. Okay, so now if we run this, as you can see here, it says enter your name exactly as you have given it. So I'm going to say my name is Mr. Armshaw. And what's your age? Let's say it's 29. And as you can see here, it said my name is Mr. Armshaw, my age is 29. And that's exactly what we are looking for. Right now, I want to talk quickly about operators or math operators. We have been using the plus sign so far, but in Python, you can use every operation you have on mind. So you can use minus, multiplication, division. You can use even module. I mean, we can use any operation we would like. Now, let's go and program these. First, I'm going to create three variables. One of them is called A, and it's going to equal to uh, 100. Then we have B, which will equal to 20. Okay, now I'm going to perform multiple operations on these and print the result. So I'm going to say Z is equal to A plus B. Then I'm going to be printing Z. So print Z value is... and I'm going to just say Z, okay? Now, I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to say this time Z equals A minus B. Now, as you can see, Z A equals B will be replaced by Z equals A minus B because we are overwriting the Z right here. So, because here it had a value, then we are assigning a new value to it. So, this value will be deleted forever. Okay, now... We'll do the same for division and for multiplication. So this is my division and this is my multiplication. Now, if we run this, as you can see, we got Z value is 120, which is for addition, correct. For subtraction, we got 80, correct. For division, we got five. And as you can see, it's five Point zero because it was converted to float. So division by default will try to convert everything to float. Now all of these values are integers right here, but by division it's a float and it makes sense because usually by division we get some decimal values. And finally multiplication we got 2000. Okay, great. Right now I'm going to be talking about random. So random is a function that can help us generate random numbers and 
it's really cool if you wanna create some small project. So, because in the next tutorial, we'll be creating a small project. So, what is random? So you give it a range, let's say between 0 and 100, and then you run it, and it's going to give you a value between 0 and 100 randomly, like let's say it could be giving us 11, 15, 99, and etc. Okay, so in order to do that, we need to import a module. Python has a lot of modules, meaning you can download and install a lot of libraries for Python. This is why it's so powerful. And the module we will be importing is called random. Okay. And the way to do it, first we would say the keyword import. And then we say the module name. Okay. Now let us execute this. Now let us code that random we have talked about. I'm going to say import random. This is the name of the library that we are importing. Now, in order to generate a number, we are going to say the following. Grant, let's say x is the variable I want to store the random number in. And we're going to say random dot rand integer. And then we will put the range. Let's say it's from between 0 to 99. Now if we say print random number is and we just put x click on run we will see that we got 14. If we run it again we are getting a different number now it is 86 again 76 again 51 again 73. See, this is what a random number generator does, and it's really cool and has tons of applications. So now we will be creating our first project. This is my project. One. You have made it so far, and we still have a lot to cover. But let's do some exercise, and we apply everything we have learned so far. Let's say that we want to create a small game that is going to generate numbers for every name. So let's say you are playing with your friend and you put your name and you let the program generate a random number between 0 and 10. And whoever gets the highest number wins. Right now, we will not be using any uh, conditional statements. We will just be printing the results and check ourselves to see who got the highest result. So, we are going to have a section for user input. Then, we will be getting the name for this user input. After that, we will run the random number generator. Okay. And then we are going to give the second name. And we will be copying and pasting this for as how many players as we have. Now this is very simple. And when you progress in Python, you're going to do it totally in a different way. But I just want to get your hands dirty. Think about it, pause the video, and try to solve it yourself. Okay, so let us write our project. There is no shame in leaving some codes from the previous tutorial. That's totally okay. Okay, now... First thing we said that we want to input the name. So we're going to say name1 is the variable and we're going to say input enter first name and then we are going to randomize this. So name1 random number and it's going to be between 0 and 10. All right. So we are not going to print anything yet. We will print the result at the end. Okay, now next let's copy and paste. Name 2, enter. Second name, let's say that the game consists of three players. All right, so let's continue. Name 3, between 0 and, and here we're going to say third 
All right. So far, so good. Now we are going to say print. Now we are going to say name one. And we will write the string got a value of. And then we will put another variable, which is name one random number. See what we have done here? We can put a variable, comma, write any string we want, comma, and then put another variable, and it will print it all as one line. That's cool. Now, let's continue. This is name one, of course. This is name two, two, and name three, three. Okay, let's play this game. Enter the first name. Let's say the first name is Jack. Enter the second name. Second name is me, Sir Humshaw. And finally, what is the third name? Uh, Tony. Jack got a value of 6. Mr. Humshaw got a value of 1. And Tony got a value of 3. Okay, I lost. That's totally okay. So the winner here is Jack. We can play this again if we run it one more time. Enter first name. Let's say you. Let's say the name is you. Second one is me. Third one is they. You got seven. Me got four. And they got five. So you are the winner and you got seven. So this is how we build a very simple interactive command line based games. Now that we broke the barrier between us and programming, let us learn some cool Python programming statements which will help us make more complex programs. We will learn about what we call conditional statements, and by that we can add decision-making capabilities to any of our programs. So let's get started. So right now we are going to talk about if statements. So what is an if statement? Well, let us say that you are driving your beautiful car. That's not really the best car out there. But let's say you are driving it. And in this car, you have the front lights and the tail lights. The car has a software, actually, and it runs all the time, and it will take care of all the electrical and electronics aspects, and even the mechanical ones that are running in the car. At least all modern cars are like that. Let's say that you want to turn on the front light, or the headlight. Now, in order to turn it on, you need to rotate this light switch that is over there. So what we do is we do rotation, for the switch and then light is on right so this is what an if statement is an if statement is a line of code that says if switch is on then turn on light it is as simple as that. This is how we use if statements. Now, let us take another case for the tail lights. We would say, how would we turn on the tail lights? Well, this happens if we hit on brake. So there is a condition in the software of the car that says if if brake pressed. What will we do? Turn on tail light. Okay, it's the same as saying this. Let's go and code this. We have the rotation switch and it's going to equal to true. Remember, you can say true or you can say 
one. It's the same thing. So let's say that my rotation switch is turned on. All right. This rotation switch will turn on my front light. Next, let's say that my brake pedal is equal to false. You can write zero or you can write false. It's all the same thing. Now, let us create two variables, one for the headlight and one for the tail light. So this is my headlight. Initially, it should be false. And this is my tail light. And this initially also should be false. Let me redecorate this quickly. Okay, now I would say if rotation switch is equal, equal to, and then put a column like that. This is how we write the if statement. In order to compare a condition, if it has a certain value or not, we don't say, we don't write only one equal sign, but we write double equal sign. Okay? So we are saying if this variable has a value of true, okay, depending on what is the value we have assigned here, I want to do something. Now, you might fall into the mistake that you would write your next statement exactly right here. Let's say uh, headlight equals true or set headlight to true. You will see that we have an error here saying it is expecting an indented block. What does this mean? If you have an if statement, you need to put the statements after it by adding an indent block. How to do that? You just go to the far left of the next statement and press tab. So right now, you would know that this statement is related to this if statement. Okay? So what we are saying here, if the rotation switch is activated, then set my headlight to true. We are changing the value of this headlight from false to true. Okay? Now, also, I want to do the same thing for the braking pedal. I would say if brake pedal equals equals true, add a column like that, then make sure you go there, press tap. Okay? And we would say tail light is equal to true. Okay? Now we can simply print the final results. I want to print what is the status of my headlight and tail light. So I would say here headlight is headlight. Copy this, paste it down here, and say tail light is tail light. Okay? Now, if we run this, you will see that headlight is true, correct, and tail light is false. So, we have, because the rotation switch is pressed, the headlight was activated, and this is what we are getting. But right here, we are not pressing the brake pedal. We have set it to false. It's not pressed. So, it's a checking. Is the brake pedal pressed? Well, is it true? No, it's actually false. So this condition is not satisfied. It means that if the condition is not satisfied, we will never execute this line right here, meaning tail light will never be true unless this is satisfied. Okay, that's it for this small section. Okay, so what do we need to do now is to program that very simplified game. We're going to define a variable called skill points and let's say that initially this skill point equal is equal to 15 now we're going to use the if else if skill points is less than 15 we are going to print you will We will say, welcome to city one. 
your vanilla level should Now, if it's less than 15, we would say, welcome to city one. This is the easy part. Okay. Now, I'm going to say else. Also, we need a double column like that. Also, we need a column like that. We would say print welcome to city two. This is going to be tough. To be tough. Okay. So now if we run this. As we can see, we said, welcome to city 2 this is going to be tough. That's really what we are looking for. Now, let me show you what kind of bug we would have if we delete this else. Let's say you are walking, you are playing an interactive game, and you don't have an else condition. As you can see, you will be printing nothing. Okay. We still have few more things to talk about regarding the conditional statement. So we have talked about if, else, but we still have one more. So we have if, we have elif, and we have else. So let's say that we have multiple explicit conditions. We can put them in if, elif, and then we have a default case without condition when none of these is satisfied then we would be jumping to the default state which is the else so let's say that you have a remote controlled car so this is the car it's a toy car you have boat from somewhere and it has a wire remember those old wire cars where they have two buttons with a remote control this is button one this is button two this is forward and this is backward okay so how would we program this car to go forward or backward using if else so we have two buttons forward and backward if we press forward it will go forward now if we press backward meaning we will be utilizing this elif if we press backward we would go backward now what do i mean by go forward or backward we would turn on the motor in a forward motion or we would turn on the motor in a backward motion okay so the motor if this is a motor it could be rotating this way or it could be rotating this way if i press this i want to rotate it forward like that if i press the backward i want to rotate it like that now here comes the else if i am not pressing anything i don't want to rotate the motor at all so i want to turn it off okay this is one use case let us go and program this small car we have two buttons, so I'm going to say here, forward button is, let's say, equal to true, meaning it's pressed. And let's say that my backward button is not pressed, so it's false. Now, let me encode the rotation of my motor so let me write a comment a comment is nothing but something that only humans can read and it won't be compiled it won't be executed by your python compiler or interpreter in our case so i'm gonna say here 
that zero means no rotation for my motor. Another comment, one means clockwise rotation. And two means anti-clockwise rotation. Okay? And let me explicitly say that this means forward and this means backward. Alright? So right now, I'm going to say motor status, like I want to know what is it, equals initially to zero. Alright? So we have a turned off motor, the button is pressed, and the forward button is pressed, and the backward button is not pressed. So let us start writing our conditions. We're going to say if forward button is equal to true, then what do I want to do? I want to set my motor status to forward, right? So motor status is going to equal to 1. Now I would say elif, see this is the second condition. If my backward button is equal to true, what do I want to do? I would like also to turn the motor status bot to number 2, right? Because 2 means anti-clockwise, meaning go backward. Now my default state, let's say if not pressing forward, not pressing backward, then this will be an else motor status would equal to zero okay now let's print also the status of the motor i would say here print car is moving forward here we would say car is moving backward and finally we would say here car is not moving okay so let us run this as you can see it's saying car is moving forward because we are pressing this button now let us press this button instead this will be true this will be false we see that car is moving backward that is correct now let's say that both of them are false meaning we are not pressing any buttons car is not moving now let's go to a corner case where we have both of the buttons are pressed and we are getting car is moving forward why is that because the first condition is satisfied remember python executes everything line by line so the first condition is is forward button pressed yes so it's suppressed, so it won't be looking at any of those anymore. Because only one of these will be executed, whoever has the condition satisfied first. So in our case, forward button is pressed, actually yes. So we will be moving forward. We did not really check the, back, the backward button because, well, this is the first one. This is the winner between the if statements. All right, so now let us implement our new project related to the if statements. Project. All right. So let's create a simple program that will determine the letter you will get depending on the grade you have. So let's say you are an instructor in a school or a teacher. And let's say there is the following letters. There is A, there is AA, there is BA, there is BB, there is CB, there is CC, there is DC, and we have a DD. Okay, let's say that to get an AA, your grade needs to be higher than 90. To get a BA, your grade needs to be higher than 85. To get a BB, you need a grade higher than 80. A CB is 75. 
a CC is 70, a DC is 65, and then we have a DD, which is a 60, and we have a final grade, which is an F. An F is when it is less than 60. So our goal is we input a number, a grade, and it will output these letters. Okay, we input a number and we output this letter. Let's go and write this in code. All right, let us program our grading. So first we need a variable called grade and it's going to take the input from the user. We'll say input, enter the grade. Okay. Now let us utilize the if statements. We'll say first if grade is larger than 90 then I, I'm gonna print you got an AA congrats okay now let us just continue next line instead of if we will be using elif if it is higher than 85 then you would say here you got a BA now you would think okay 85 higher than 85 could also mean 90 but remember we are executing this in sequence so if this one wins we will never get to this anyway all right this is why it's totally okay to do this now if I change this to if as well here is the problem that's gonna come out now we will see two problems here actually, but bear with me. If I run this, and the grade, let's say it is 95, I'm gonna get an error. And it's saying this operation, this one, does not is not supported between instances of string and integer. What does this mean? What is the type of this? It's an integer, right? But what is the type of the input? So you are putting input, you are taking, the program is taking your input and storing it in grade. But the input here is a string actually, and it is not a number. Input always gives back a string. So you're saying here, is some text larger than 90? Well, this makes no sense actually, because here it needs to be a number or an integer, a float, any number in order to be able to compare it. This is where casting comes in. Now, casting is just converting a value from one type to another. How to do that? Let's say this is a string and I want to convert it to integer. I would simply just do integer, open a parenthesis on the whole instruction and close it here. Now, this should resolve the issue. Let me just remove this for one second and run this. Enter your grade, it's 95. And as you can see, we have no errors anymore because we have casted it. This is casting, converting from one type to another. Now this returns a string, it was converted to integer, and integer is comparable with an integer. Now, let me go back to the other issue I was talking about. If I said here, if instead of elif, if I run this, and I say my grade is 95, I would get two messages. Why is that? Because when I use elif right here, if this one is successfully satisfied, then I will never execute whatever I have from elifs or else's. It will just be omitted. But if I use if and then another if, each condition will be evaluated individually. They are not related to each other at all, right? So you will evaluate this. If it's satisfied, it won't omit this. It won't ignore it. It will just continue and execute it as well. This is why if you want to use this format, you would need to say and 
grade is less than 90. Okay, now if you execute this and you put 95 here, you will only get 1 because now this condition is not satisfied because we are now specifying a range. You need grade to be 85 and at the same time, you need grade to be less than 90. This is what AND does. It says this condition and at the same time, this condition. Okay, now I'm not going to get into this. We don't want to do that. We will just say elif. Okay. Now, if elif 85, you'll get a BA. Now, if you execute this, you'll see that you'll get only one statement. Let's say 95. You got only one statement. All right. Now, let us continue. Elif, this is larger than 80. You will get a BB. Elif, this is larger than 75, you will get a CB. Maybe in the next one, let this be 70. And now we have this, the 70 is CC. And then we have 65. Maybe I won't say congrats for a 65. But you still passed, so this is a DC. And finally we have a 60. And, and then we have a 60. This is a DD, almost passing. And we would say else. Okay, right now let's utilize the else. You got an F. Sorry, you failed the course. Okay, now let us run this. What's your grade? Let's say I got 71. We got a CC at 71. Now let us run it again. Let's say that we got 41. You got an F, you failed. And the program is ready. Congratulations on making it here. You already know the basics of Python. These concepts that you have learned so far can be applied to any other programming language. Now we will learn about organizing our variables with what we call lists. It's like an array if you are coming from a different programming background. And if not, you can think about it like a shopping cart where you can add and remove groceries. So let's play around with some lists. And now let us talk about our next topic, which is called lists. Lists are very important in Python. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say that we have a user interface for a program, for a website. Doesn't really matter. Let's say that we have three buttons. Button 1, this is, let's say, will navigate to the main menu. Let's say a second button will open a file. You know those file open, uh, settings and stuff. And then let's say that we have the help. We have a help button. It will take us to support. It will take us to some documentations. Now... If we want to implement this according to what we have learned so far, we would have created something like that. Let's say button, main, variable. Okay, let's say it equals to a string like main. We would create another button. For file, it will equal to file. And then we will create another one. Let's say it's called help. And it equals to help. Okay. Now we have defined three variables so far. And this is really a problem. Let's say that we have in our GUI around 100 buttons. Do we really need to define every single one of them just like that? Especially that maybe all the buttons have the same properties, the same shape, the same everything. Do I need to define it like that every single time? The answer is no. 
we won't be doing this. We will be doing something like that. We will define a list. We will call it buttons. And we will put all of our buttons inside. So this is an empty list right here. If we want to fill it, we would do something like that. So this is main. This is file. And this is help. Make sense? So this is how we define a list. Now, now how can we access the elements of this list? There is something called index, which is the number corresponding for every element inside the list. And these numbers start with zero. So this is zero. This has an index of one. And this has an index of two. Okay. So if I say something like a print, buttons and we open a bracket we say zero what do you think it's gonna print well it will print the element that has index zero which is main same thing if you put one if you put two you will be printing file and help this is how you access it but the thing to remember is the axis is always starting with zero. So the first element is not indexed as one. It is indexed as zero. Okay. All right. All right. So let us write some code. I'm going to define a list that contains, let's say, names. So I'm going to have a very simplified database that contains names. And I'm going to do it like that. So names is equal to let's say that we have five people here first one is called james ellie mr homshow adam and ida okay so this is called the list and you see that the definition of a list is done by opening a bracket and putting all of our elements. Now, how about we create another list for the ages of each of these, okay? So I'm going to say ages is equal to 24, 25, 21, 48, and 17 okay so as you can see list can take numbers it can take strings you can put any type actually whatever type in python inside the list now let's play around with the with accessing these now if i say print names let's see what would i be printing let me clear this print as you can see I print the whole list with the brackets if I try to print this variable. Now, if I try to print ages, I will just get the same thing. Well, okay. Now, what if I want to print the name and the age of the first element? How would I do it? Think about it. Talked about it a few minutes before. What I would do is print then i would specify names and the index let's say i want to print the first element or the first person in my list so this is james so this is zero and i want to print the age even though the age is in a separate list and this is not really preferable if you have a related list like that there's another way to define them but just for clarification purposes this should be okay now i'm going to say ages zero okay now if i click on run and yeah i'm gonna remove these first run again you would see that james 24. now let's say that i wanna print the fourth person remember this is the fourth person what is the index of the fourth person well we start from zero so zero one 
two, three. So the fourth person in our list has an index of three. Okay, so if we put three here, what should we get? We should be getting Adam and 48. We got Adam and 48. See how indexing work? Now let's say that I put an index that does not exist. Six. You would get an error called list index out of range. It's important to remember this error because you might face it when you program in Python. When, you, when there is an error called list index out of range, simply this means that you're trying to access an element inside the list with an index that is out of the bound. The bound here is from 0 to 4, and we are trying to put 6. Same thing if we say 5, for example. If we try to run this, list out of range. Okay. Okay, now we are going to continue with lists. I'm going to continue with the methods we use in order to add elements to lists. So add elements. How can we add elements? Well, we can do that by saying append. And then we specify the element. What does this mean? Let's say that I have a list of names. So name one, name two, and name three. Okay, now let's say I want to add name four. How would I do that? I want to do that in runtime, meaning I have a program running, and I want to add one more element. The way to do this is, let's say this is called L, I would say L dot append, then I would say something like name 4. Now this name 4 will be appended to the end of my list. Okay? So I'm going to give you an example on how, what append means in some real application. Let's say that you have a shopping cart, okay? And you want your user to be able to add to the shopping cart. So initially right now, we would have a shopping cart that is empty, all right? This is how we define an empty list, okay? Now let's say that you want to let the user put the name of the item and it will be added automatically to the list. Now let's say that we want to append three items. All right. How would we do that? We would say item one or just item equals to input please enter the name of the product. Okay. Now let's say he entered here oranges. What happens is this oranges now is stored in item. Okay. Now if we append item to this shopping cart, we would have oranges in our shopping cart. How would we do that? We would say shopping cart dot append. What do we want to append? Whatever the user gave to item. Now we have added whatever the user put here into item, and then this item went into the shopping cart using the append me list method. Now, let us repeat this multiple times, let's say three times. Two, three. All right, and finally, I just wanna print whatever I have in my shopping cart. So print your items are shopping cart okay so we will print the whole list now if we hit on run please enter the name of the first product let's say oranges now let's continue what's the next one let's say that we bought milk 
And finally, let's say that we bought almonds. And as you can see now, it says your items are oranges, milk, and almonds. This is how you create a list in Python and you append to it. All right, so we are still talking about lists. But this time, we are going to talk about removing elements from list. We have talked about adding elements. Now I want to talk about removing. So we have two methods. One of them is called remove. We have also pop. And we have a delete all, which is called clear. What is the difference? Well, remove is very simple. You have item one, two, and three, and you just want to remove one of them by name. So you would say list dot remove, and then you would specify what do you want to remove. Let's say I want to remove number two. Now this will be deleted. Okay, this is for remove. Now there is also pop. If you say just l dot pop, pop is going to remove this item, the last item from the list. Remember, append added an item to the end. Okay, but pop is going to remove an item from the end. All right. Now, finally, we have clear. If I hit L dot clear, this will remove the whole content from my list. All right. Let's code this. So let's say we have this same shopping cart. And let's say that the user has added an item by mistake and he wants maybe to change it, wants to remove it forever. But we need a mechanism in order to do that. So what would you do? Let's say that this is your shopping cart. You already inserted all the items. You would do something like that. You would say shopping cart dot remove. Let's say we don't want the almonds anymore. So almonds. Then let's print the shopping cart. Hit on run. You will see that we have removed the almonds. That's good. Now, you need to be careful. If an element does not exist or there is a problem in the capitalization of the letters, you will have errors. So I changed the A from small, from capital to small. Now, if I run this, I will get a, an error because it says list x remove x is not in the list meaning that the element here does not exist in my list okay just be careful about that i just want to remove the last item i have inserted so maybe i wrote an item by mistake uh i have a typo for any reason let's say i just want to remove the last item i would just say shopping cart pop now if i print this you will see that it removed only the last item, which is almonds. That's good. Now we, now we know how to remove the last element and we know how to remove by name. Okay. So lastly, let's say that I want to clear all my shopping cart and I don't want it anymore. I want to start over. I would say shopping cart dot clear. Now, if I run this, you'll see that my list is empty right now. All right. So we have covered this as well now there is a very important function that we can use which is called len which will return what is the length of my list we are still at lists okay and this len if you just type len like that open a parenthesis and pass the name of your list let's say l it will return the number of elements inside it okay why would this be useful well let's say you have a list and you are appending to it and you want to say when i have 10 items 
uh, please do something, right? So how would you measure what is the length of your list? This is the way by using this length. It's also important if you want to check if your list is empty, right? Let's say for any reason uh, you want to check the condition if I have a list and it's empty, meaning that len l is returning a zero to me, then I want to do some action. Okay, the way to do that is with len as well. Let's go and see some examples. All right, so we are back at our oranges, milk, and almonds. What I want to do is to check what is the length of my shopping cart. In order to do that, I would say simply length, create a variable, let's say, in order to store what is the length. And I'm going to say len shopping cart. Now, simply, if I print this, length I would get three because I have three elements well that's really good now let me clear this so I'm gonna say shopping cart dot clear meaning my shopping cart will be empty right now and I wanna and I wanna make a condition that if my list is empty to print me some message so I would say if len of shopping cart is equal to zero okay then print your shopping your shopping cart is empty so let us see what's going to happen now hit on run you'll see that we printed the three first because we are here then we cleared it and now we are checking if it's zero or not as you know when we clear it we don't have any elements anymore meaning what is the length when we have no elements well of course it's zero so i'm saying here if the length of my shopping cart is zero then i want you to print your shopping cart is empty and this is what we have printed. And now we are going to continue talking about lists, but this time they are nested. What is a nested list? Well, remember when I told you that list can contain any type of variables? Well, somebody thought of putting lists inside lists inside lists. Hmm. So we can put lists inside lists, and that's really useful in a lot of scenarios. So if I define a list like that, I could open a large main list, and the elements are going to be lists as well. So let's say first one is one, two, three. Then second one is four, five, six. Can you see that? Take a look here. This is my first list and this is my first element in the list okay and this here is an element inside the list inside the list okay indexing these is going to be interesting why because this element right here has an index of zero and this element right here has an index of one relative to the large list right is that correct because we have two elements in the main list this is index zero and this is index one now what about this if i want to access the number right here what should i do well to access that you would need to say i want to go to l zero this will give me access to this list when I say L0. And then if I add another bracket like this, and I say element 0 again, it means that I am accessing this one right here. See what we have done? So we need two brackets, two brackets. These two brackets will get us access to the first list. Then these two brackets will give us access to the 
list inside the list. Now, let's say I want to access this floor right here. What should I do? Well, I would say L. What is the index of this element relative to this list? Well, if this is 0, this is 1, right? So this is L1. Correct? Now, what is the index of this element relative to its list? What is the index of 4 relative to its x? It's actually 0. It's the first element. Okay? Now, let us give more examples. Now, let's try this element. This element is inside this list. And this list has an index of 1. So, L1. Then we go tinier. 5 is also inside this list. What is its index, the 5 relative to this list? It's 1. See what I mean? If you have questions, please write me in the comment section. Now we're going to apply this. I'm going to create a list and call it database. Okay? And it's going to be like that. A list which contains two lists. One here, comma, two here. I'm just making spaces for you to see better. Okay. The first list will contain the names and the second list here will contain the ages of people. So this is John and this is Mr. Hamshu. And here's the ages. Let's say 25, 29. All right. So I want you to Remember what I've talked about a few minutes ago and tell me how can we access Mr. Hamsha right here. Pause the video for a second and think about it. First, we need to specify my list, which is database. Open a bracket. Now, Mr. Hamsha, where does it exist? Is it in, in which list is it? Well, as we can see, it is in list number one. This is list number one and this is list number two. Remember, list number one, we start the indexing from zero, so the index is zero. Next, now we go tinier. Now, within this index zero, what is the index of Mr. Hamshaw? This is the list for, for it. This is index zero, and this is index one, right? So, zero, one. Now, if I put all of this inside a print, and run we would get Mr. Hamshaw. Great. Now how can we access this one? Same thing. We write the name of our list then a bracket. This is list number two, right? Meaning what's the index of the second list? This is zero. This is all zero. This is one. So we have one here. Now we go tinier. Inside this number one, where is my 29? Is it zero? Is it this element or this element? Where is it 29? It is index number one, right? This is index zero. This is index one. And that's it. Now if we print this, we would get Mr. Hamshaw, first one, and 29 right here. Okay, that's really good. There is one more data type that I would like to talk about along with lists, which is called tuples. A tuple is defined like this. So T for tuple is equal to, we open parentheses like this, and we just pass elements to it. So A, B, and C. Now we can access the elements inside the tuple just like the list. We can say print maybe t0 and we would get a t1, we would get b and t2 and then we would get c. Now let's try something. If I say t0 and then I try to change the element to a different letter, let's say like q, I would get an error because tuple object does not support item assignment. What does this mean? It means that once we create the tuple, we cannot change any of its elements. 
Now you might ask, where do we see tuples anyway if we cannot really change their elements? Well, in libraries like OpenCV, for example, we would see tuples when we are working with coordinates. Usually, all coordinates are passed as tuples like that with the x coordinate and the y coordinate. We see them also when we are passing colors in OpenCV. We would see that we pass colors like this. We pass the R value, the G value, and the B value. So tuples have some limited usage, at least in the world of Python. Now, it was designed for a larger purpose than this, but developers worldwide agreed that tuples is not used as much as lists because of their inability to change their elements, for example. I want to give you the syntax anyway because you are going to encounter it in a lot of libraries. Even though the focus is more on lists, tuples cannot actually be ignored entirely. All right, so we have talked about lists. Now I want to talk about while loop. Why do I want to talk about while loop? Well, if I want to create continuous applications, I would need to put them in a loop that will continue looping forever. Okay? So, as you have seen so far, we were doing uh, some code, we were writing code, we were executing in sequence, and then when we reach the end of the code, what happens? Stops. The whole program stops. Well, I want this to continue and jump back to the beginning every time. This is important if we are creating stuff like menus, like GUIs, user interactions. We need this kind of mechanism that will continue looping. Okay? There is tons of applications for this while loop. Now, let's go and see how we can program that. Okay, so, how can we program an infinite loop? We simply need to say while, one, and that's it. Now everything inside here will continue repeating forever. I'm going to just make a user input. Let's say this is user input. And it will say, enter a letter. Now this program will execute forever. It will keep asking us, enter a letter, enter a letter. We will enter a letter, it will repeat. Let's say that we are printing the letter afterwards. So print user input. Okay. So we will be entering the letter and then printing it. This will continue forever. Now I'm going to create a condition to break out of the loop. It's important to always have an exit point from the infinite loop. Otherwise, your program will never stop until you force it from your command line. So we're going to say if user input is equal to remember it needs to be a string right because user input is storing a string uh, exit then how do we break out of out of a loop we just say break see what's happening we are taking the user input printing it now we're checking what is the user input if it equals to exit i want to break out now let's try this enter a letter a B, C. Enter whatever you want. It won't exit. It will continue forever. You, me. Now, if we type exit, we are out of the program, as you can see. We broke out. This is the use of while one loop. Now, while loop has different syntax for different cases, but for an infinite loop, all you need to do is only this. And don't forget you need an indentation block. As you can see, everything is within indentation with respect to while. Same here in the if, we have an indentation for the if, for the break inside the if. Okay, that's good. Right now, I want to cover one last thing, which is not officially a Python syntax, but it is a concept that is used in many programming languages, and it's called FSM, meaning finite state machine. 
Now, why do I really love this concept? This concept will help structuring your program if you have multiple states. So let's say that you are playing a game and this game, it has commands like walking, attacking, defending, conquering, building. It could have multiple states, right? So, and every state would have certain actions that are allowed and certain actions that are not allowed. Like in attacking, you can swing your sword, but let's say you cannot walk. Let's say in defending, you also can sit and crouch, but maybe you cannot really use your sword. You can only use your shield. When you are walking, there are a set of actions that maybe you need to update, like the map coordinates. So what I mean is, these are all called states. And in your program, you could have uh, multiple states, like as I said, attack, defend, etc. Now, the way to visualize this is as follows. Let's say we are in an initial state. Okay, it's called init. Now here, let's say we are controlling our character using keyboard. Let's say as long as we are not pressing anything, we are staying in the init state. Right now, let's say that I want to walk, so I press uh, W. Let's say we can only walk by pressing W. Okay, if I press W, then I will be turned into the walk state, and maybe here I can do more multiple stuff like updating the map coordinates, like changing the graphics, etc. Okay. Now, let's say that I am in init. What else can I do? Let's say I can attack when I am not doing anything. Let's say if I press G, I could jump to a state that is called attack. All right. I can also maybe if I press K. I know this is a weird keyboard controlling for a game, but just for an example here, I will be defending. Okay, so we can jump from init to attack to defending to walking. Now, let's say that we added an option that will make us walk and attack at the same time. So maybe after walking, we can jump and say here there is a state that is called attack and walk. Now, in order to jump from walk to attack and walk, we need to be pressing, let's say, W and G at the same time. Now, if I want to jump from attack to walk and attack, I also would need to press W and G at the same time. All right. Now, I can change from attack to defense as well by maybe pressing K. Same thing. From walk to defense. I could do that by pressing K. Now, I could jump from defense to walking by pressing W. And I could jump from defense to attacking by pressing K. See, this is a state machine. This is how our character moves. Now, how do we implement something like that? I'm going to just give you a very simple code. We will be using while one. To repeat this forever because we want the character to keep moving then we'll be using if statements if keyboard key equals this if keyboard key equals this and that okay this is how we program some sequence of actions that are independent or dependent on each other okay all right now let us program our finite state machine. We'll start with while one. And I'm going to do something very, very simple right now, just to make you understand the concept more. So I'm going to be having state one. If I press W, I want to jump to state two. Now from state two, if I press G, I want to jump to state three. And if I press L, I want to be jumping to state one one more time. Okay. 
So this will go in sequence. Now let's say I'm in state 2 and I want to jump to state 1. I could do that by pressing S. Okay? So how can we code this easily? We have three states. So let us define three states. We are going to say state equals to input enter a letter. Okay. Now we will print you have entered state. We will print what we have typed in. All right. Now we just need an initial number for the state so that we, are, we can start somewhere. So initially we are in state one. All right. Initially we are starting right here. So I'm going to say here, if state equals equals one. So right now I am in state one. Now, what are my options to jump from state one? Well, I could only jump to state two. I have no other option. If I press W, it will make me jump to state two. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to name this state. I'm going to name this transition, transit. Because the transition is what we are entering, not the state. We are jumping between states. All right. So now I'm going to say if transition is equal to W, okay, meaning I press W, what do I want to do? I want to change the state to equal to. Okay, makes sense. We are in state one. If I press W, I want to change the state to two. Now, remember again, these are called transitions and those are called states. Make sense? Transitions are whatever you press and state is actually the state you are in, the collection of code you will do when you jump to that stage or state. Okay, so now let's say that elif we are in state 2. What's going to happen? What routes do I have in state 2? In state 2, I could go to state 3 by pressing G, or I could go to state 1 by pressing S. Right? We could say here, if transit is equal to G, where do I want to go? Well, with G, I go to 3. Then state is going to equal to 3. Now, else if, if transit is equal to s i need to go to one then state would equal to one so far so good now the last state if state equals three where can i go i can only jump back to state one if i press l so we would say l if but on the level of this right l if state equals three what do i want to do now check if transit is equal to L, I want to jump back to state 1. All right, now let us just print the state we are in at the end. So print right now you are in state state. Okay, let us test this out. Okay, we have an invalid syntax at line 22, as we can see. Yes, because we did not put the column. Again, we have another problem in line 26. We did not put equal equal. See, you always check here what is the problem. It says syntax error, meaning check that there is at line 26 a problem. And as you can see, we have put one equal sign for the if, and that is wrong. Okay, we are starting. Enter a letter. Now, let's say that I have entered W. It says, right now you are in state 2. Is that correct? Well, we are in state 1. Enter W, we are in state 2. Correct. Now, let's go to state 3 by pressing G. Now, if I press G, it's saying, right now you are in state 3. That's also correct. Now, where do we want to go? We are here. We, have, we only have one route to state 1, which is by pressing L. So, if I press L, we are back in state 1. That's really good. Now let us test this route right here. Okay. Let's jump to state 2 by pressing W. We are in state 2 right now. If I press S, we can go back to state 1. S. And we are back to state 1. 
that is really, really good. This is exactly what we are looking for. We have created a finite state machine. Now, what would happen if I put a letter that does not exist? We would be staying in state one, right? What does this mean? It means that there is an arrow like that when we are putting an invalid letter. Okay, we are staying where we are. Always, there is when, whenever we have an invalid, we are staying in the same state we are in. Right? All right. So by that, we have finalized finite state machine and we have an idea how to create sequence of actions using Python. You made it here, meaning that you are halfway through Python basics. Now we will learn about loops. A loop statement will save you a lot of repetitions in your code. They are like a smart way to repeat multiple statements multiple times with a few lines of code. At the end of this section, we will learn the basics of how a picture can move on the screen. We will be utilizing some really cool techniques and we will see how moving objects on the screen take place. So let's get started. Right now, we are going to be talking about loops. What are the Python loops? Let's take a look. So as the name says, a loop is doing something over and over and over again. Before, we have talked about the while one loop, which was an infinite loop, right? So we would have multiple line of codes and we would be repeating them forever. Now it's a good idea to implement a very small application for loops, which is a counter. We want to be able to print one, two, three, four, five, up until any number we say. Now, so far we have learned that we can do that by saying print one, print two, but this is not really practical. We want a way to do that. And the way to do that is by using something called the for loop. Let's see how we can program a for loop. Let's say that we want to print the numbers between 0 up to 100. Okay? How can we do that? We would say for. And we need to specify something called a counter. This counter value will change and sweep in between a certain range. So if we say for i, then we say in range, what is the range I want to sweep between 0 and 100? We put a column like that, and all we need to do is just print i. What's happening here? As I said, this is the counter. This counter value will change for every iteration. We will be, so in the first loop, the i will be zero. It will execute this, and then its value will increase and go back here. Now i equals one. It will execute this, so it will be printing i, which is one now. Then it will loop again. Now it will be incremented by one. Now i is equal to two. Again, print, what is i? It's 2, it will print 2, and so on and so forth until we reach 100. We will print 100 and we will exit. Now, let us see what's going to happen. And as you can see, we have printed everything from 0 to 99, but we did not print 100. Because the print here is actually this value minus 1. So if you want to print all the way to 100, you need to specify this to be 101. Okay, now if we do this again, as you can see, we are printing from 0 to 100. Now, we don't usually use loops for such applications. What we really use loops for is to iterate, let's say, over a list. So let's define a list. And I'm going to call it L. And this L is going to have the following elements. Apples, bananas, and strawberry okay so we have strawberries bananas and apples now how can we print all of these but one by one you know 
Before, we've said that if we want to print a list, we just say print L. Okay, now let me remove this. If I print, I'm getting the list itself with the brackets, but I'm not printing the individual elements. What if I want to extract every individual element? Well, we also have learned that we can access them by index. So if we say print L0, we would be getting apples. This is great. We are extracting them, but if we want to extract all of them and print them separately, we would need to do something like that. Print L1 and again print L2, right? This is a lot of code and this is not really practical. What we can do instead is say the following for now let's create a placeholder that will while we are looping it will keep the value of every element in every single loop so for let's say element and we say in l so what do we mean by that what we are saying is for every element that is stored in L, what is L? This is L, this whole list. And now, since we will be looping for every element, how many elements do we have? We have three, so we will be looping three times over this list. We will be, in the first loop, we will be taking apples, so element will equal apples. In the second loop, element will equal bananas. And in the third loop, element will equal strawberries, okay? So now if I say print element itself, and I remove these, as you can see, I got the same output, but with shorter code. Now imagine I have hundreds of these. I can loop over all of them simply by doing that. Did you get how for loop works? Just an element that will extract every element inside the list it will store it inside it for every loop and we are just printing whatever it's storing in that specific loop okay now let's do another practical application let's say that i have an array that has numbers by which are one three five seven and nine and for some reason i want to shift all of these numbers by two see what i mean here every number i want to make it plus two so I want to change this to 3, this will be 5, here it will be 7, here it will be 9, and here it will be 11. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, we simply loop over it and we increase every element by 2. So we would say for element in A, so get every element in A, and we are going to say element is equal to element plus two now if we try to print element we would get three five seven nine eleven that's great we have done that but what we are doing here is not actually storing or replacing these values in a so right now if i print a the value will not really change let's take a look as you can see, the value of A is still as it is. Why? Because this is a separate variable, actually, and we are just changing this variable and printing it, but we are not changing the elements inside A. So how can we really change the elements inside A? Well, we can do that by using the method we used before in the counter. So we would say something like for I in range, what is my range here? Well, it's from zero, but what is my max number? I mean, I want to change the value of each element of this list, but I really don't know what is the length of my list. So I would say len of a. Okay. Remember, we've talked about len. Len of a is going to be replaced by how many elements do I have here? In my case, I have five. So it's the same as saying 0 to 5, okay? But since my list length could change, I would make it dynamic by just saying until the length of A, okay? What do I want to do? I want to change every element value in here. How would I do that? 
Well, a i is equal to a i plus 2. What do I mean by that? How can I translate this to English? Well, again, we are going to be looping through all of this list one by one. But we are looping through a counter, right? So what we are saying here, we are saying i is going to sweep a value between 0 and 5. Take a look. If i right here is 0 in the first loop, it will be a0 equals to a0 plus 2. What is a0? Well, it is 1. So I'm saying this element here, I want its value to change to a0, which is 1, plus 2. So let's replace a0 with the real value. It is 1 plus 2. So I'm saying, hey, my a0, I want it to equal to 1 plus 2, which is 3. Okay, now let's continue. The next loop, we're done with the 0. We will increment this by 1. So right now, i is equal to 1. So it's a1 plus a1. What is a1? a1 is actually this element, right? And it equals to 3. So this will be like replace a1, which is this element, with this new value, which is 5. Okay? And we will go like that. So let's say that we reached 4. So a4 equals a4. Change the value of a4, this one, to a4 value, which is 9 plus 2, meaning 11. So now this will be 9 plus 2, it will be 11. Okay, so right now, if we just print the whole A array, we will have an updated list, as you can see here. So this is how we modify values of a list. If you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A. And if you like this series so far, please hit on like and subscribe for more easy to understand content and right now we will be continuing with more for loop function so far we have learned how we can iterate over a list that contains multiple items we have also learned how we can iterate over a certain range of numbers but sometimes we would like to combine these two iteration techniques together so let me give you an example let's say that i have a list of cars and I have the brands of multiple cars, let's say BMW, Hyundai, Toyota, and let's say Jaguar, etc. What we have learned so far is that we can iterate over this list and print it out. So we will say for items in cars, we can say print items. And here we will be getting all the names one by one. Now, Sometimes I would need to actually print the index of every element. Right now I am only printing what's inside the list, but what if I want to print the number of every element? So I would like to print BMW is 1, Hyundai is 2, Toyota is 3, and Jaguar is 4. We can certainly just say for items in, let's say, range between 0 and the length of cars. We can certainly say that, and then we would be printing items, and we will be getting 0, 1, 2, 3. And then if I want to print the car, maybe I would say print cars, and then pass the items as an index. So we would be getting 0 BMW, 1 Hyundai, and etc. But Python supports a different method, and you will see it in any professional Python code, which is. We will be saying here for i and items in, and then we would say enumerate cars. Okay? Now all I need to do is just print items and print i. The syntax of me having the list and its index is not necessary anymore if I am using this method here. Okay? So here. If I just print the item and the i, I will be getting BMW 0, Hyundai 1, Toyota 2, Jaguar 3. See what's happening? Let us arrange them in a better way. So here I would say i and then the items. 
Now let me print this. You'll see zero and the car brand, one car brand, etc. To use enumerate, you need a counter first, and then you need the variable that will be assigned to all of your list elements. What I want to talk about right now is what we call the zip keyword. Now, let me create two lists. The first one is going to be containing some shape labels. So I'm going to say here shapes is equal to square, circle, and let's say triangle. Next, I would like to have a list that contains the centers of those shapes. So I'm going to say centers is equal to a list that contains multiple tuples. Let's say the center of the square on the screen is at the coordinate, let's say 10 by 10. So the X is 10 and the Y is 10. And then I have the circle is centered at around 50 by 50. And let's say that the triangle is centered around maybe 100 by 100. Let's say that I would like to print every shape and its center. Python tries to minimize the index axis as much as possible. This is why it invented all of these keywords like enumerate and zip. Let's see what zip is. But first, let me give you a scenario where we will not be using zip. So as I said, we will be printing the shape and the center next to it. So we will say for i in range let's say from zero to the length of shapes, right? This is how we try to iterate over everything. And then we'll be printing shapes, i, and then here centers, i. When we execute this, we will get square, and then the coordinate, circle, the coordinate, and triangle, the coordinate. That's really good. But as I said, Python tries to minimize the syntax because relatively for Python, it's slow. This is why we have enumerate, we have zip. So let's see how we can do the same thing, but with the zip keyword. I'm going to leave everything here and just write in the line just below it. I'm going to say four. Now we need two placeholders, one for the shape and one for the centers. So I'm going to say shape and center. Those are just placeholders. And then we will say in and then say zip, we will be passing shapes and centers, okay? And here I'm gonna be saying print, shape, and center. Now, this is the same as getting a variable iterating over a list, but let's say you have now two lists, you would need two variables. So we created the two variables, then we would say zip to pass the two lists inside. I mean, we cannot just say in shapes and centers, this syntax will not work. If we execute it, we will get too many values to unpack. This is why we have zip, actually. Now we have two keywords. Each one is iterating over a list, and then we are extracting them right here. So it's a really very similar syntax. Now let me comment this out so that it's not printed. If I print this, you'll see that I got the same thing. And the zip keywords can take multiple lists. Let's say here I have the color of every shape. So maybe here I have red, blue, and yellow. Now I can simply just pass color here as well. And here just say color. Now this needs to be colors actually. These are colors. And this is the placeholder called color. These placeholders can be called anything you want. Now let's print the color. If I execute this, you'll see that now I have shape, center, and color for every shape I have. And this is how we use the zip keyword. All right, so what I want to talk about right now is something called list comprehension. This is a very important topic in Python, and it saves you a lot of time when you are coding for loops. So let's say that I have a string S, which contains the following, this. Okay. 
it's just a string that says this okay and i would like to extract this string and put every single letter in a list all right the conventional way to do that is by just saying for maybe l for letter in s and then we would say something like let's create an an empty list here let's say this is li for list and it is empty so here i would say li dot append l right this is how we usually do it and this will iterate over every letter we have and then it will add it to this list so i will end up with something like this i have a list and it will be like d then we have the h then we have the i then we have the s okay we will end up with something like that but take a look we had to write a for loop and a statement to do that with list comprehension we can create a shortcut when we are trying to append to this list the syntax would be something like that let's say that li right now will equal to we will open a bracket and we are going to say x for example and here we would say for x in s and that's it so what we are saying here is take this x and start adding it as an element to this list what is x exactly here we are specifying what is x so initially we are saying add this x to the list or append this x and then here we are specifying what is x exactly and here it is for x in s meaning that extract every element in s in every loop and put it in x okay so it will automatically end with this list right here okay it's a really simple syntax but sometimes it's confusing because we have an x here and x here what does this mean so this is why i'm just making it easy for you the first x is nothing but what you want to put in your list and then you are specifying what is x exactly let's try to code this so right here we are going to create a string which equals to this is nice maybe okay and in order to implement the list comprehension all we need to do is just say s is equal to meaning update my s to this new value x for x in s now if i try to print x sorry not xs take a look here we have all the letters unpacked into this list even with the spaces see the spaces right here are just an empty string that's good now let's say that i need more conditions maybe i don't want to include the spaces well you can simply just add a condition to this list comprehension as well all you need to say is if x is not equal to an empty space right this is all you need to do now run it again and you will see that we got rid of all the spaces let's say that maybe i have another condition maybe i don't want the letter i to be included okay so all i need to say is and x is not equal to the letter i okay we don't want any i's and here we go we removed the i's and the spaces so you can add as many conditions as you need actually that's really good so let me sum it up one more time i know i have repeated this multiple times just separate it like that for the syntax remove all the conditions for less confusion separate this to two sections create a letter here let's say x whatever and this letter will be what will be packed inside this list then just say a simple for loop for x the same x variable you're saying which will be unpacked in the list in whatever list you have so this x in every iteration 
we'll go inside this S and extract every element. Where will this X go? It will go in here in the list. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to create a list with a certain range. You can easily do it like that. So we would say li of numbers that maybe let's create a list that is called like this. And we'll say for and we'll say x for x in range of maybe 100 or maybe this is too much 10. OK. And now all I need to do is maybe just print this list of numbers. I'm going to remove this print for a second. And let's print it. As you can see now, you got yourself an array of numbers. So that's really good. All you said is for x, for x in the range of 10. So extract the whole range from 0 to 9 and put it in x. And then this x will be populating the whole list. Let's say that maybe you need only odd numbers okay, in this list. You don't need any even numbers. So all you need to say is if x module 2 is not equal to 0. If the number module 2 is equal to 0, mean, it means it's even. If it does not equal to 0, it means it is odd. Now, if I try to do this, you'll see that I got only odd numbers. Let's say I want even numbers. Just say equal equal. And I will be getting 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, which are even numbers. So list comprehensions can be really, really useful in many cases. OK, so right now we are going to start a new small project. What is this project is about? Well, when you are learning programming, you might not be able to relate to some really big project because especially when you are learning the basic. But I will try to give you an example that is really close to the real life applications. Let's say that you have your computer. This is your monitor. OK, and let's say that you have a drag and drop functionality. So this is an image right here. All right. And this image can be dragged and dropped all the way to wherever you want it to go okay you can drag it and drop it here by just holding and then dragging to the other side all right now every image consists of pixels right it is those lighting small things that give the image the shape it has right and every pixel right here has a coordinate on the screen so let's say this is my screen and let's say that this is my x and this is my y now for example let's say that this pixel has a coordinate of 50 on the x and 30 on the y now let's take another pixel and it is this one this one is moving towards the y as you can see and the x is the same right i mean this value and this value have the same x, but they have different y's. So this is x and this is y. So it has the same x and y is increasing, let's say, by 1 for the next pixel. And we can continue sweeping all the y's, right? Same thing, if we go to the right, this pixel, for example, has an x of 51 because we moved only one unit to the right. And it has the same y because we are only moving to the right. We are not moving up and down. So it would be the same y. All right. Next pixel would be 52, 31, and so on and so forth. As you can see, we end up having multiple coordinates. And here where I will link the drag and drop for you uh, to this concept. Now, when you drag and drop, what you are telling your computer is change all the coordinates of this area from the screen to those coordinates okay so maybe by just changing from here to here we are shifting all the x's by let's say uh, 200 pixels and we are shifting all the y's by let's say 10 pixels okay because when you are moving it, you are actually shifting all the pixels with the same amount on the X 
and with a certain amount on the y, right? Does this make sense? I mean, this pixel will be here, this one will be here, here. They are just moving from one area to another area with a fixed ratio. I mean, if this ratio is not fixed, what does this mean? It means that the image will not keep its form. If this pixel changes to here and the second pixel changes to here, you will have some really messed up image. Okay, so here where we will be creating a small function that will take coordinates and it will translate it with a certain X shift and a certain Y shift. Okay, let's see how we can do that in Python. All right, so let's work on our small algorithm, which will be shifting pixels to any direction we want. Let's assume that I have a picture with the size 4 pixels by 4 pixels. And let's assume that my whole screen is 16 pixels times 16 pixels. Okay? All right. So, let, let us first define our pixel for the image. So, this is the image pixels. And we said it's going to be 4 by 4. So, let's create a list inside the list all right so this is the first row it has four pixels this is one two three four now second row also four also four and also four so we have four by four image each one of those is the pixel location now i'm going to assume the following this is my screen this is 16 by 16 and my image is at the left top portion. This is a 4x4 four four image. Now we're going to do some operations to move this right, like that, and then some movement left. All right? Let's do this shifting. So let us fill the position. Since it will be at the top left, it's going to start from uh, position 0, 0. Then we are moving. Uh, in the x-axis, right, because this is a row, so y will be the same, x will move, so it's 1, 0, 2, 0, and 3, 0. Now we are moving in the y directions, so this is going to be 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, and 3, 1. Next. This is 0, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, and 3, 2. Finally, we have 0, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, and finally 3, 3. Okay? This is my pixels. Now, how can we implement the shift? We will be utilizing the for loops. We are going to say the following. For i in range between 0 and whatever the length of my image pixels. What are we saying here exactly? What we are saying is, I want this i, this counter, to loop over every position individually. Remember, a position has an X and a Y. So, every single position we will be looping through them. Alright? Now, we are saying loop from 0 to the length of image pixel. Remember the length uh, function we have talked about? It means that it will see whatever the, the size here we have and it's going to go to all of them. Alright? So, what are we going to do? Let's say that my goal is to shift the x-axis, okay, in the positive x-axis, 3 pixels, meaning 3 pixels to the right, all right? So, I am intending to move the index 0 of every position by 3 pixels. How would we do that? We need to replace this index right here for every position. How can we replace it? We need to say image pixels i 
And what do I want to change? Remember, I am changing the x, meaning index 0. Is going to equal to image pixels i0 plus 3. So, since we are looping, this portion right here, only this portion, is related to looping through those. Now, this portion says that when, while you are looping through those, check the index 0 and replace it with, again, same. Let's say we are at the first element, index 0. What is the value of Im image pixel i0? Well, assuming i is 0, it means that we are at this cell and we are looking at the 0 index, meaning this one, and we are replacing it for what, to whatever value it is, which is 0 in this first element, and we are adding 3. When i equals 1, we will be jumping here, so it will be image pixels 1, 0, so it is this one, right, because this is the 1, and this is the 0, and we are adding 3 to it, so it is 1 plus 0, it's going to be 4, all right? Now, if I simply print my image pixels, as you can see now, all the x positions was increased by 3. Can you see that? It was 0, 1, 2, 3. Now it is 3, 4, 5, 6. It was 0, 1, 2, 3. Again, again, 0, 1, 2, 3. Again, 3, 4, 5, 6. And so on and so forth. Now, let's say that after that, I want to shift by two positions, two pixels down. So shift Y axis. Two pixels to, or let's just say downwards. Okay, so I'm just going to copy all of this, add it here. And all I need to do is just to change that I want to change the y's, not the x's, right? And I'm going to move it by two pixels. Now let's print again. Now this is the second print. As you can see now, all y's were increased by 2. So we have all 2's right here, all 3's right here, all 4's right here, all 5's right here. Okay, so we have completed this small exercise. Now it's time to leave the main Python space and move to the functions space. Functions are like shelves that organize our code. Instead of spreading everything in one place, we will organize our code chunks in a more meaningful way. This will also help other programmers understand your code, because after you start using functions, the overall look of your code will be much better, more readable. So let's go and get started writing some functions. All right, new topic, and it's about functions. And no, this is not the same as math functions. Okay, so let's give an example of what functions are. Functions are important in order to eliminate repetitive code in our code. Okay, so instead of writing something a billion times, we can just write it once. Or call it once. What do I mean by that? Let's say that I have a database of a company and this company has multiple branches. So let's say this is company branch 1, company branch 2, company branch 3. And it has an employees list. Each has an employees list. Okay, this is employee 1, 2, employee 1, 2, etc, etc. Now, let's say that I have hired a regional manager. Okay, bear with me. Now, when I look up this regional manager, I want to see it in all the databases 
in every branch okay because he is directing all of those branches so when somebody looks him up in a certain branch he should be able to see him in all of them now I know this is a little bit of an exaggerated example but bear with me let's say that I want to add this regional manager to all of those let's say that we have multiple roles that need to be included in all of the databases now the way we have learned in order to add something to a database we would say let's say that this is my list or database we would do append right and we add the name of the employee now we would do this for database one database two same thing database three we would append the same name now imagine if i have around five roles that needs to be appended to all of these databases well this is name one okay i would need to do the same thing database one dot append name two maybe a second regional manager or a second general role i would need to do the same thing for database two three all of them are for name two right so i'm gonna be creating three lines of code every time i want to add a general employee who needs to be added to all three databases imagine if i have 15 employees like that well 15 employees times times three this is around 45 lines of code this is repetitive this is not right and here comes what we call functions now a function if we just define function let's call it function one we could do this db1 append name we will pass name here we would do db2 dot append name and same for db3 okay this is a scope which is called function now everything we have written so far we have written it in a function actually and it's called main all the code that we have written even though it's not visible it's written in main okay everything now inside this main that we were writing we would say instead of writing all of these three lines of code i would only say func one and pass a name and i'm done it will jump to this piece of code every time and it will do all of those operations let's say i want to append a new name all i need to say just func one and a different name okay it will jump take this name and fill it here for me okay now let us see how does this work in action so let us code those functions we have talked about so as i've told you whatever we write here this is main okay so right now let us define a piece of function that we will go to every time we want to execute some code let's add that database functions we're going to say definition add to database this is the name of my function you can call it whatever you want and here is a parameter to pass we are going to pass name to it okay this is a parameter that we pass to the function so that we can use it in our uh, function so what do i mean by that let's say that this is where we write our function and here is my main all okay? right so if i want to call this function i would have to say add to database and just pass it a name let's say john all right this is all i need to do then this piece of code will execute and add it to the database same thing i would just do the same thing and i will say add to database mr homshaw 
okay it will go and do whatever necessary in order to add it to the database i don't have to do all the steps every time in the main okay let's see how we can implement those steps now the john here is the name the mr Hamsho here is going to be the name again okay so let us now just fictionally actually and i will tell you why i'm saying fictionally let us define the databases inside my definition inside my function so let's say database one which is for the first company branch it has employees like uh kate moss david same thing here database two let's say that it has different employees like lee steve okay and database three we have tony and laura all right now what we are going to say is db1 dot append name same thing for db2 same thing for db3 i'm going to append this regional manager let's say to all my three databases at once all right so right now whenever i call this function all of this will be executed whenever i call this function all of this will be executed with the name mr Hamshu or with the name john or whatever now let's let us print here print db1 is db1 let's do this for all the others now let's hit on start as you can see right now we have added john to my database for the first one and we added mr homeshow to our database see what functions do they really save you a lot of coding if i need to do this regular way i would need to write three lines for every one line here so we have saved around 70 percent all right but if you have noticed i added john here but i cannot see it here when i added mr Hamshu. now this is what i said let's take this fictional example okay it's because these databases were defined inside the, the function here and whenever i execute this function and i exit it any variables will be deleted so those are like temporary memory so remember i call a function it goes here it executes everything okay it executes every line but once i'm done executing every variable that i have defined is going to be deleted hmm. so this is what we are going to talk about next now i'm going to talk about global variables well this topic comes hand in hand with functions it's also related to scopes what does all of this mean well remember we can define functions so define func1 and it could do some stuff then define func2 it could do some stuff and then i have my main okay which is also doing some stuff now if we create a variable here this variable will be deleted after execution okay same thing here this is another variable same scenario now in main this won't happen if i created a variable here it will stay so i can say 
that the scope of this variable here is only function one and the scope of this variable here is only function two it means this variable here is alive only as long as function two is executing by the end of execution of function this variable will die okay now what can we do in order to create a variable that is accessible by everybody let's say i want a variable that's accessible by main by function two by function one by everyone at the top you could define something called a global variable okay so if you define a variable just at top let's say variable here it's equal to doesn't really matter to an empty list let's say now each function can have access to it and actually modify it it doesn't die it stays here it is there forever okay so and this is called the global variable this is called the global however in order for this global variable to be accessible let's say by this function one right here we need to write it as follows we need to write a global var if you don't try to global it won't understand that you are referring to this one okay so if you just write variable like that as in here this won't actually modify the one right here only if you write it like that like this way you will be able to modify it here okay so it's a condition that you add the global keyword inside the function in order to modify it now you don't have to do that in the main now let us apply this in an example so we have implemented this example previously and we had a problem that we defined the three databases inside the function and when we tried to add them and print them we printed them correctly but adding two names resulted in only adding one of them if we run this again as you remember we said that we tried to add john we added it but when we tried to add mr Humshow, john was gone because the databases are defined inside the functions which will die actually once this function is done executing what we need to do is cut all of these put them here now those are global variables and let's cut all of these and just put them outside okay let us try to run this huh things are much better now we have john and mr Humshow in every database that's great so right now this database scope is global and everybody can access it that's why you don't just put variables inside a function unless they are temporary variables to help the function do its job now i have talked about global why didn't i mention global inside the function remember i said that you need the global keyword in order to modify any of those that are global well since here we are not really changing the variable value from its root and only modifying an object or let's say we are only modifying it for now well we don't need to add a global but i want you to observe this closely let's say that i want database one to equal to only that name okay i want to delete everything will this work will i keep everything that i have done will all the names be kept or will they be replaced remember my goal here when i do this is to replace it i mean i want to delete everything and just add the names i am putting here right so the first print should generate me all johns so right here when we execute this all of those should be john and then when i execute this it will be overwritten and all of them should be mr Hamshow, right because bear with me because look here add to database john 
modify database and make its value only equal to a list that equals John. Same here, same here. Next, add database, add Mr. Homshow. Again, override the whole database and just make it equal to Mr. Homshow, Mr. Homshow, Mr. Homshow. So if I print those, I will get Mr. Homshows only. Let's see what's going to happen. As you can see, the value did not change at all. See, it's no John, no Mr. Homshow. It's just stayed as it is intact. Now, in order to do, be able to modify a value of a global variable from its root, like change it entirely, you need to do global. So you need to say global D1, then say global D B2, then say global db3. Now what you have done is you have linked this db here, linked this db here, and linked this one here to the global ones. Now if I run it, I should get all Mr. Home shows. And as you can see, I got all Mr. Home shows. And by that, we have learned what is a scope and what is a global variable. Just to a quick summarization, if you want to only modify a variable like appending to a list, you don't need to do this global, only if you want to change the variable from its root. All right, so we are continuing with functions. We are not done yet. We need to talk about return values. What are those? Well. Our beautiful template here, having a define a function, it takes some argument or parameter and it does something and then we have our main. Okay, sometimes we would like to send data from main to the function. We want the function to do something and then return a result back to my main. What could this be? Could be anything. I could create a very simple function here that maybe it will just multiply my, the number I pass by seven. So I would say, hey, argument is equal to argument times seven plus 100. I could do an entire mathematical operation here and just say return argument. Now in my main, I have called func with number, let's say six, and I assign it to a variable here. So what's going to happen? This function right here will jump all the way. It will pass six. So this is six. Now we are saying this argument that you have passed will get updated and it will equal to the value itself, which is 6 times 7 plus 100. And then the final result will be returned here. Hmm. Now this result will go back to main and it will be stored in this x. So x will equal to whatever value that argument, that returning argument has. Okay. Let me give you a simpler example. Let's say that I have a function called power, power of two. Okay, and I pass it a number here. And it will just say return number times number. It will only do this. Okay, now in my main, all I need to say is y, let's say, is equal to power 2, 7. So, let's track it one more time. 7 will be up here, it will be passed here. And we are returning, what is number here? It's here and here, so this will be 7 times Seven. So the result is 49. I'm returning 49 here. Okay, so where I am, am I returning this? Back to the main. And exactly 
to the variable that is supposed to hold the result of this function. So this whole function now will be replaced by 49, which will be the value of y. Okay? So a return is simply a very simple number or a list or an object that will be returned from my function to my main. Let's write a small program for this. Let us define a function and see how return works in action. Let's get to it. First, let's have a define. And I want a function that returns. And I have a function that you pass to it a number at, and it returns power 2 of this number. Okay? So I'm going to just call it power 2. And here I will be taking a number. The easy way to do that is just by saying return number times number right now see this return I'm gonna show you now how we can save this return in the main now this is my function now I this is my main right everything in function will be under the function with a block indent like that so if I have more code to write I just write it all with the same block indent that is this space right here okay the moment I just go away from this space and I am on the beginning of the line, I am in my main. So right now, I'm just going to say uh, result is equal to power 2 and let us pass a number. Let's say 5. Okay. Now, if I just print result, I got 25. So what happens is this power is called. We are here and we are passing a number to it, which is num. So this 5 is actually this num. Now we have num times num. What is num? It's 5. So 5 times 5 is 25. And we are returning it and exiting this function. So instead of this whole function right here, we will get the return value. Okay. So right now, the return value is here and it will be assigned to result. Okay, so result will be 25. There is also another case where I can return multiple values. So let's say I want to return two values. First one is the power 2 and it equals to num times num. Okay. And then maybe I want to return something like the division of these two numbers. So maybe num divided by num. So all I need to do is just in return, I would say return bw2 and return diff. Okay, so the calculations are done here. Now I'm returning the result variables. Now in this case, I'm still need to I need only to pass one number. That's correct. But returning will not be okay if we have only one variable because we have two variables to be returned. Now if I try to just run this, what I would get is the result being packed with two values all right a better way to do that is to actually have two variables so maybe bw2 and div all right so right now if i say here bw2 bw2 is and i just say bw2 same here div is and div is equal to that now if i run this you would see that bw2 got the right result and div got the right result right because 5 over 5 is 1 and 5 times 5 is 25 okay so you need to watch out when you are returning two variables you need to prepare two variables to catch it after the function is executed and is returning okay you can have multiple values to be returned using Python, and that's really a powerful trait that Python have, and, and most other programming languages don't have this feature. Okay. The section is going to be really, really fun because we are going to create a ping pong game that two players can play at the same time. This section is based on a library that is called Turtle. And Turtle is a very, very simple library 
that helps us create simple games like those we saw on the arcade in the 80s. So let's get started and code some turtle. First we are going to say, first we are going to import what we call a turtle. Before we start coding any game, let us create a window that will show our game. We are going to create a screen first, and this screen is called turtle.screen, capital letter, and by that we have created the screen. Now we can give it a title, so I'm going to say screen.title, we're going to call this ping pong. Next, we can specify the background color for our window. So I'm going to say screen.pg color. And then we are going to say that the background is going to be blue. Next, we need to specify the size of this screen. So we'll say screen.setup. And then we will say the width of the screen is maybe 800 pixels. And we have the height and let it be 600 pixels. We are almost done. We just need to activate the tracer. So we have screen.tracer and we need to initialize it with zero. And by that we have prepared our screen. Now if I click on play, I will be getting a window that looks like this. But it will crash immediately. So let us add one more thing which is called screen update. And this will be in an infinite loop. So we will say while one. To create an infinite loop, then here we will simply just say screen.update and we will run the program again. Now take a look, we have a window that is called ping pong, it has a background of blue and we have a width of 800 and a height of 600. So this is how we initialize our first window using turtle to create our ping pong game. Now let me explain how will this ping pong game be. We are going to create two bars right here that will represent the player paddle, which they will move up, down, right, and left. We have two of them, and then we have a ball in the middle that will be bouncing between these two paddles. And the goal is whenever this ball will be bouncing between the players, and if a player can get the ball into his opponent other side wall, like right here, then he will get one point. So this is what ping pong is. Now let's start implementing more functions and see how easy it is to create simple games with Turtle. Now after we've done and created our window, let us create our first puddle. So to create a paddle, we are going to do the following. I'm going to define a variable that is called paddle underscore one. Okay, so this is for player 1. And then we need to create an object that will be our paddle. The way to do that is just by saying turtle dot turtle capital letter. Now turtle is those objects that will be moving around the screen and we are creating a turtle object, which will be our paddle. We can specify its shape, we can specify its color, we can specify its size and its position. So let's do all of those that I have just mentioned. First we need to say paddle underscore one. And now we need to specify the shape. How do we do that? We just put a point dot like that and then just say shape. Now the shape here is going to be square. This will be my paddle one. Now how about we choose its color? So I'm going to say paddle underscore one dot color. And the color here is going to be white. Okay, what's next? We need to specify the shape size. So we're going to say paddle underscore one dot shape size. And here we can specify what is the width and the height of this square. Remember, we are trying to create a rectangle that will be our paddle. So let us simply just say stretch underscore width is equal to five and the stretch underscore length is equal to 1. Okay, now let's see what's happening on the screen. If I try to execute this, I will be getting a rectangle like that that is white in the middle of the screen, but it does nothing. But this one has a potential to be moving around. Why? Because we created it using a turtle object. 
Now, don't worry about these terms like object, because we will be talking about all of this in the object-oriented programming section. But for now, just imagine that you are creating a function of that turtle, and you can pass to it a shape, color, and shape size, and you can do all of this stuff with it. Okay? So as you can see, it's very simple so far. Now let's add more functions. How about we change the position of this rectangle? I'm going to close this. The program will crash here. I'm going to close, press this X button here so that we can execute again. And now let us specify the position. If I say paddle underscore one dot go to, which will specify the position, and then just say minus 350 and zero. What does this mean? The window we have will be divided into two sections. The width will be spanning between minus 400 until 400. If you add this up in the absolute value, you'll get 800, right? Because we have 400 in the minus section and we have 400 in the positive section. So the screen will be divided into two sections. The height as well will be divided into two. We have plus 300 and minus 300. Okay, so let me illustrate this really quick to you. If this is my screen like this, and I specified that I want the width to be, uh, let's say, 800, and the height to be 600 like that, then I will be having an origin point, which is here at zero, and here I will be having two sections, okay? This is the zero point, this will be my minus 400, and this will be my plus 400. Okay, so here the values are increasing from 0, 1, 2, 3, all to 400. And here the values are increasing minus 1, 2, 3, all the way to minus 400. Same thing for the height. If we go like this, this is my height. This is still my 0 point. This will be plus 300. And this will be minus 300. Okay, so the screen will have 1, 2, 3, four sections okay so right now i said that i want my paddle to be at the most left which is at the minus 350 i'm leaving about 50 pixels margin so that we can let the ball go behind the paddle in order for the second player to score on the first player so let me execute this really quick i'm gonna press this x button to refresh everything and execute now, you will notice that there is this weird line that is happening here. And the position is correct of the final rectangle being at the minus 350, right? It is at the far left side of the screen. And the Y point is being at zero, right? Because the Y is this vertical line and the X is this horizontal line. Okay, so this one is correct. But what about this fine line we have here? The reason is when you say go to, it will be drawing all the way from the center to whatever position you are specifying. So this go to, we actually use it to draw shapes on the Canva or the window right here. How can we prevent this and just move this rectangle from being in the middle to being on the left without drawing the line it went through? Well, we need to use a function before that which is called pen up. So I'm going to say here, paddle underscore one, then dot pen up. And now if I execute this again, let me refresh, run this. As you can see, the line is gone and we have created our paddle. Congratulations, now you have your first playing object. How about we create a second paddle that will be on the far right side? Well, this is very easy. I'm going to be copying everything I've done here. I'm going to just put it here. And then I'm going to change the variable name to paddle2. And how about we only change the position to be at plus 350. Let's close this, refresh, and run again. Now you'll see that we have two paddles on parallel sides of the screen. This is at 350, 0, meaning 350 at the x-axis and 0 at the y-axis, right? And this is at minus 350 and 0. Okay, that's really great.
Next, we will be adding some functionality to move those pedals around. All right, so right now, how can we add functions to move the pedal to the up, down, right, and left? Every position will have its own function. So we will be having in total four functions for every pedal. How can we do that? Well, we are going to define a function here that is called pedal underscore one underscore up. This will move the layer one pedal up every time we press a key, okay? So, the first thing we want to do is to take the current position of our rectangle. What is the initial position here? It is minus 350 for player one. So, when we call this following function, it's going to read wherever the pedal is on the screen at that reading moment. So, I'm going to say here, y is equal to paddle underscore one then we will be calling here a function called y coordinate meaning that i would like to read the y coordinate of that paddle why the y coordinate well because when we want to go up and down we are moving on the y axis so up is a plus y and down is minus y so first, I would like to know where is it on the y-axis right now? Where is my paddle? Then this will return a number. So initially, this number will be zero, right? Because we are looking at the y-coordinate. This minus 350 is for the x, the zero is for the y. Okay, so what happens next? What I would like to do is, after I read it, I would like to change the y-coordinate into a new coordinate. So I'm going to say y is equal to maybe y plus 10. So I'm going to be moving this 10 pixels whenever I am moving up. So this whole object here will be going up 10 pixels on the y-axis. Is that it? No. We have defined a new step. Now we need to set it or confirm it and send it to the paddle. How do we do that? We just say paddle underscore one. Then we say dot set y, meaning give y a new value and then we pass it the y value okay and that's it by that we can move the paddle up now we need to link this to a key right because right now yes we have a function that will go up but what is the key that we should press in order to execute this function we need to call the following we need to say screen dot it is the same screen we have created at first and we will call a method here which is called on key press meaning whenever i press a certain key i want you to do the following what key is it well let's say when i press w i would like to go up so here you specify hey if you see me press w call the function pedal one up okay so here i will be passing this function name pedal one up and I will be linking it to this W key. So I press W, pedal one up will be called and it will be executed. There is one more thing that we wanna call, which is called the screen dot listen. Meaning that the screen will be listening to your keyboard to see if you press any key. Now let us test this quickly. I'm gonna close the previous program, click on this X right here to re refresh the environment and then we will execute one more time now take a look if i press w we have an error here let's take a look yes this is a function actually that we did not call we need to pass parentheses because we are calling a function right here now let's try again i'm closing this let's refresh the environment and let's run it now if i press w you'll see that the pedal is going up and this is what we expected but here is the catch. If I continue pressing W, you'll see that the rectangle will go out of the screen. We are going to solve this issue immediately. Let's close everything, refresh the environment, and here we will be setting a condition. What is this condition? Well, we're going to say if Y is larger than. So let's give the pedal a space to move to the top. What is the height here? It's 600, so meaning 300 up and 300 down. 
Now notice here if I say if y is larger than 300, meaning that if you see that this paddle is trying to exceed the screen, then what I would like to do is say paddle underscore 1. Then we're going to say set y to 300. What does this mean? Remembering that we are, whenever we are pressing up, we are increasing this y by 10 and setting a new y. Now, if we calculate and see that y is over 300, I would like to set y to be 300 and never increase at all. Now, 300 is the wrong value, and I'm going to show you why. Even though it is the limit of the screen, this is not the right way to do it, and let's see why immediately. I'm going to run this. If I try to go up, you'll see that we still exceed the screen, but we stop right here. Why is that? Because we are not accounting for the height of our paddle itself. So a better way to do it is to take is to take the maximum height we can have minus some margin. Let's make this 240 instead of 300. Now let me run this again, reset the environment, and rerun. Now if I go up, you'll see that I stopped here. So I just left a small margin over there at the top, and that's it. Now we are moving up correctly. Let's reset this. Now, same way we did this for the first player, we are going to do the same thing for the second player. We will say here, pedal 2 up is equal to y equals pedal 2. Okay, same thing, y equals y plus 10. And same thing at the y right here. Everything is just the same, but here we need pedal 2 instead of pedal 1. We also need to assign a key for the second paddle, so we will say here screen on key press and then paddle 2 and here we need to say up, up like that, meaning that when we press the upper arrow on our keyboard, the second player is going to move up. Now let's test this. Now if I press the upper arrow, you'll see that it is moving, I'm pressing the W as well at the same time. And now both the players are moving up and stopping at the boundaries we have specified. That's really cool. Now we have two objects moving on the screen using our keyboard. This section is all about dictionaries. And no, it's not similar to the word dictionary we know of. This is a data structure that is very similar to lists, but it can be more organized than lists. It can hold keys and value, which is super helpful when we are trying to create small databases to store our information. Don't worry, we will be explaining all of that in details, so let's get started. Let us now start a new topic, which will be dictionaries. Now, dictionaries are similar to lists, but they are more of an advanced data structure. A dictionary can have two parts. One of them is called a key and we have a value. Okay, we have a key and a value. So what could this be? So what do we mean by key and value? Remember, when we used to do lists, we used to do something like that. Let's say we want to put the name and the age of someone in a list. We used to do something like this is John, this is his name, and then we put we would put something like maybe 27, and we would close it. Now, as you can see, there is no indication that this is a name and this is an age. We are pre-assuming, and we already know that this data structure, this list, can, on, on the first index it has a name, and in, on the second index it has an age. How about a way that we can already write in our list, for example, that this is a name and this is an age. This is the main difference between a dictionary and a list. In a dictionary, we have a key and a value. In list, we have only values. Okay, so these here correspond to the value in dictionary. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you want to create a new employee, okay? You want to add them into the database, but you would add them as dictionaries. So, it would be something like that. 
name this is the key and then there is a value which is let's say John okay then we would say something like age of course all of these are in quotation marks age is let's say 27 see right now I can go to this dictionary and just say print me the name or print me the age okay there is a special syntax for that which we will see in a minute so by that we don't have to memorize the index of the name the index of the age I'm not, I won't be really concerned with memorizing the indexes of each of my uh, data and values inside my list. I would only say, print me the key. You know, the name is the key, right? So print me the key which is called name or print me the key that has a name of age. This is what dictionary is. Let's go and write some code. All right, now we are ready to write some dictionary code. Let us first define a dictionary and I'm going to call it here database db now to define a dictionary first thing you want to do is open a curly bracket and now we will write our keys and our values let's start with name so our first key is going to be name and the value is going to be john all right let us continue now maybe we will have the age as well so this is age and let's say maybe 27 Let's maybe have the birth date. And the birth date, uh, let's write it also as a string. Let's say that it is 1st of January, maybe 1996. And okay, by that we have defined what we call a dictionary. Now, let's say that I want to print the name inside this database. Well, I could simply say print db name now if i click on run you'll see that i got john here so unlike list as i said you don't really have to memorize the index of your name so that you can display it since we were doing something like that name or not name maybe john and here the age we would have to remember that okay this index zero is the name index one is the age we don't have to do that anymore we would just define a key which is name and we would say hey print me the name that is in here now we know how to print every value of every key let us try age for example we should get 27 and we got 27 let's try birth date and the birth date here we go we have it here as well so far so good now sometimes we have dictionaries that we get them from different libraries in python and we would like to see what keys do they hold we can print all the keys in a dictionary like that we would say print db dot keys now if i run this as you can see right here i'm getting name age and birthday so right now i know all the keys that exist in my dictionary right here so far so good we are still talking about dictionaries okay one of the great uses of dictionaries is that they can contain lists so if i have a dictionary of names i could add a key that is called name Okay, and I could have a list as a value. Okay, so same thing here for age. I could have a list. So right now I could create a small database. This is a small database where I could keep all of my information. I could have multiple names here. Let's say name one, two, three, four and each corresponding age is going to be blocked in like that we can have more information as well so let's code this small database so let us quickly code a list inside a dictionary which is as i said is a very very useful case and you will see it 
a lot in tons of codes on the internet or in your job or in anywhere. So let's get started. We have a database and we are going to open a curly bracket like that. And simply I'm going to say name, column, and then I will have a list of multiple names. So I have John, I have Mr. Homshow, and I have Kate, let's say. Now, let us add another key, which is the age of each of them. So this will be maybe John is 27, 29, and Kate maybe is 23. Now, if I just print the database as it is, I'm going to get everything that this database has, the keys, the values, everything. Let's say that I want to print all the names that are in here. So again, even though it's a list, it won't really matter. I could just say DB name. And as you can see, I got John, Mr. Hamshra, and Kate all inside the list. Now, what if I want to print a name and the age next to it? So all I need to do is name and then add the index. So I want the first name. So since this is a list, actually, it has the same indexing we have learned before. So this is index 0, index 1, index 2. So same thing now. If I just say db age 0, I would be printing the first age. So right now, index 0 and in all entries, this index 0 will be corresponding to John. So it could be his age birthday, occupation, place of birth, all of those would have index 0 and index 0 is dedicated for John. Okay, so if I run this, I would get John 27. What I want to talk about right now is how can we add keys and values to my dictionary without actually having to write it. Let's assume that I am starting with an empty dictionary, okay? And throughout the program, I want to be able to add these values. This is very important. Most of the time, dictionaries are added in while the program is running in runtime, okay? So the way to do that is very simple. All you need to do is start with an empty uh, dictionary. Let's delete this line. And then let's add the same entries we had, but dynamically, meaning through runtime. After we hit compile, this will be filled. So all I need to do is do something like DB. Let's say names. And here I could either put one value or a list or whatever I want. In my case, I just want to put here John and Mr. Hamshaw. Okay, let's say I want to add another pair of keys and values. Okay, so this is my age, let's say, and again, 27 and 29. Now, not 7, 9, all right. Now, if I print my database, you would see that I have filled my database like that. This is how we can actually add elements to my database. Now, this is how I actually can add keys and values to my dictionary. Now, let's say that I did that and I want to add another entry here and another entry here. All right. So the way I did it right now is creating a whole new value to names and a whole new value to age. What if I want to update age and names? Like, let's say you have a program where you have a add button where you can add employees or you can add a product. You would need to click on add and whatever database you have, you need it to be updated with the new item. Let's say it's a let's say that it is a database of employees and you want to add a new one. You want to be able to click on add and you would have a new name here and you would have a new age right here, right? So the way to do that is by using update. So the way to do that is as follows. 
you would need to say db dot you would need to you would need to do db let's say you want to add a new name dot append let's say what is our name let's say kate we want to add kate and we want the age of kate so we need to append to age and here the age is let's say 23 and let me run this we got an issue that okay it's names not names sorry about that let's run again and here we go we have kate and her age see what happened here we were able to use append because this is a list append is a method that corresponds to list this is why i was able to append to my list even though this list is inside the dictionary it doesn't really matter all i need to do is refer to which key do i want to append to in my case it is the names key and then since the value of this names key is a list i can append to it all right assume that i don't have a list here anymore i have only a single value like the first example we had the age is only a single value Will this append actually work here? Because I told you that append only works with lists. We had the list here as a value that had multiple names, but we deleted it and now we have only one name and only one age. Let's take a look and see what happens if I try to append when we have no list in the value of this key. Run. You will get something like no attribute append because dictionaries cannot really use the method append unless we have a list right here because it's not using it on the dictionary it's using it on the list itself so how can we actually let's say update the value here if we don't have append like i know i will update it with a single value maybe with the list but how can i update it at all well i'm gonna remove this and i'm gonna remove this and append is going to switch to update because right now i am updating the whole uh, key and its value now what should i put here well we need to open a curly bracket and we need to say name names and let's say john all right same thing here we need to do the same thing for age so here we have age and it is 27 okay now mr homshaw should be replaced with john and 29 should be replaced with 27 let's print this as you can see we got it I know this is maybe a lot of information regarding how to deal with dictionaries but once you got used to them they are really powerful data structures that can be really helpful in tons of scenarios okay now how can I change here and go back to a list well I would also use update because I want to remove the single value and change it with a list right so whenever you want to change the value here and write something from scratch like changing its type from single value to a list you need to use update all right as long as it's not an empty list only for changing and updating i mean all right so here i could go back and just put this in a list again and just add mr homshaw one more time and for the ages i would also do the same thing 27 and 29 now if i hit on run as you can see now we have list one more time now i can go back and use my append method one more time so db names dot append gate again i could append one more time the age of gate let's say to be 23 run again and we are appending again How about this? What if I want to delete one of my keys? Now we learned how we can append them, but what about deleting them? Well, we can simply do that by simply saying delete 
db let's say i want to delete the whole names i don't want this names key nor its values so i would only say names now if i print i get only the ages that's good let's say that you have a problem here you had a typo in the key or maybe the key does not exist yet because in the runtime maybe this key will be added later but you tried to delete it before it's added all right so let's give this scenario right here where we don't have names yet as you know we are appending names later in the code but we are trying to delete it before appending anything because my dictionary is actually empty now if i try to run it I'm going to get key error names and this could crash our program. This is why we need to be careful here. You need to add a small condition, which is if names in DB. Okay. Now only if this names key is inside this dictionary as a key, then we will be deleting this otherwise no now if i try to run this again we won't have any runtime errors and the program will execute even though the key does not exist i still want to talk to you about dictionaries but this time i'm going to be talking about how can we delete a list element inside a dictionary Hmm. So we've seen before that we had a dictionary that had a key, let's say it has a name, and we had a list of names, name 1, name 2, name 3, name 4. And we have learned how we can actually delete a whole key and just remove it totally. But in most cases, especially when I have lists, what I want to do is I want to delete only a certain element from my names. Let's say that we have a supermarket and a certain product is not used anymore. I mean, we are not actually bringing it in the market or buying it from the supplier anymore because maybe it's discontinued for any reason. And I just want to remove it from my database. Well, of course, I'm not going to go and delete the whole names, right? It makes sense that I only delete this small element. But in Python, we need to do some tricks to do that. First of all, we let's say that we are using these indexing techniques where we have, let's say, multiple data, let's say price. And item one has a price of $2. Item two has a price of $3. This is for $7, one, two, three, and the last one, let's say it is for $17. All right. So every element actually is connected to a price. Now, what I want to do is I want to delete this whole group. Remember, this all of these has index zero. All of these have index one. All of those here, index two and all of those have index 3 all right i want to delete one of the indexes so how can we do that well we would like to get the index of a certain name this is actually very simple so the steps are the following step one get the name of the element name of delete element which one do i want to delete all right now step two is to search for the index of that element search for element index so there is a function in python actually that will bring me the the index three delete this index for all keys so let's say we have two keys. I would delete this certain index from my keys. Okay. So first, locate it. Let's say this is uh, tomato. So the name is tomato. Check which 
index it is using the function because maybe it's not in index 0 it could be in index 100 so the function will go search for this tomato and give you the index of it finally we will apply delete index for all of our keys let's see how we can do that in code let's say i want to delete john from the database so i need to delete john and his age well the way to do that is by first locating the name i want to delete john so i would say db names dot index john it means that go to db names we went to db names and get me john this is john and get me his index his index is zero now i want to store this index here in a variable let's call it index all right now we gave the name step one we got the index step two and step three is to actually delete it from all the keys. So what I'm going to do is delete db names and then index. Now I want to do the same thing actually for my age. Now if I run this, John is not in the list. Okay, because here John is a capital letter. All right. Let's run. And as you can see now, we have Mr. Home Show and Age. That's really great. Now, you might ask, what if I have a 100 key? What can I do? Should I write delete key, index, delete key, index for every single key? Well, that's not really practical. And this is why it's time to learn about iterating dictionaries using loops. Let's do that. So, as I said, I did not like it that I have to give the names in this way. So, let us iterate over the keys, read the keys one by one, and then delete that index for every key. So, I'm going to delete these for a second, and I'm going to say for key in db.keys all right i just want to show you something now if i say print key take a look i got names and age so using this for key in db keys which is a small method we use on dictionaries which will extract all the keys for us and store them in every iteration inside this key. Well, by doing that, we can sweep the keys and do whatever we want for every key, right? If we have a 100, if we have a 50, we don't even have to memorize what is the name of every key. All we need to do is just put key and delete that specific index, okay? Let's say in case of deletion. Now, all I need to do is the following, delete db key index. Does this make sense? Key is changing and sweeping all the keys. In the first iteration, key is names. Second iteration, it is age. And we are deleting that specific index, which is zero. So we are deleting John, his age, and whatever information we have in our database regarding John, because we have his index. Let's run it. But first, let's print it. At the end, run this. And we're good. John is gone from our database without actually having to know any of the keys. Now, for example, let's say that you would like to see the values of your database. Okay, so let's make it here. Let me comment this for a second. This is comment. It means it won't be used in the code anymore. All right, but it's there. We can read it, but the interpreter cannot read it. Uh, okay, so let's say here for value in db dot 
values. And if I print value, look what's going to happen. Okay, let me remove this. Try again. Okay, as you can see right now, by doing that, we are printing all the values inside my dictionary. As you can see, I'm not printing the keys, I'm not printing names, and I'm not printing age. I'm only printing every value individually. Okay, now let's try something else. What if I want to break these down into individual values? Right now, I am printing them as lists, right? What if I want to print it just like here, like names, like age, individually, not inside the list? Maybe I want to, because I want to use it somewhere. I cannot use it if it's inside the list. So, to do that, we could do the following. For subvalue in value. And let's print subvalue. Run this. As you can see now, I have them individually. What did I do here? We have talked about iterations in lists, right? And iteration in list, we used to have a keyword and we just loop inside the list. This is exactly what we have here. Now, value here is saving every list individually. This is one loop. Then I'm taking every list and I am breaking it down to its individual elements and printing just that individual element. So I'm going to visualize these two loops for you in a second. Take a look. I had a for loop that is looping my list, right? So I was saying for value in values, right? I was also saying for subvalue in value. Of course, here we have a DB. Okay, so first of all, I was bringing every value I had in my dictionary. So I had here John and Mr. Hampshire. And I had ages, 27 and 29. Look, in the first loop, I am getting the values of my dictionary, right? Those are the values. This whole thing right here, all of it. This is a value in a dictionary, right? So right now, this value here in the first iteration, let's say iteration 1, Value is equal to John and Mr. Hamsho in the first iteration, right? We are still in the first iteration for this for loop. Now we are opening a new for loop and we are saying for sub value, so create a new variable called sub value and iterate over whatever we have in value. What do we have in value? We have John and we have Mr. Hampshire. So right now, in the first iteration of this for loop, sub value is going to take the values one by one. So it's John. See? Now, remember, this for loop right here is still in the first iteration. Now, this for loop is going to finish all its iterations. Then we are going to go back to this for loop, right? Because how for loop works is that everything inside the for loop will finish, then we will increment. But what if we have two for loops? Well, the inner for loop needs to finish before we go back and this for loop continues. So, this is the first iteration we are printing John. Now, in the second iteration, sub value. What is the next iteration? What's the next thing in value here? It is Mr. Hamsho. It's going to, e to equal to Mr. Hamsho. Right? So we are printing this. And we are printing this. Now, let's go back. Now let's go to the second iteration of our 
big for loop. What's going to happen here? We are saying for value ones in the dictionary value as well. We took this one. This is the first value. Now, second iteration, we're going to take this as a second value. So right now, value is equal to 27 and 28. Right? Now we are going to continue and we will jump back to this for loop. Now we'll go back again and say first iteration sub value is going to equal to what is it going to equal to in my case right here it is the first element because this is the first iteration it's 27 and in the second iteration this sub value will equal to 29 so we are printing 27 and 29 see how the cascaded for loops work big for loop small for loop First iteration in the big for loop will start. All the iterations of the second for loop need to finish. Then we go back. Second iteration of the big for loop. Then again, all the iterations for the sec for loop will continue. Okay. And right here, the big for loop is passing the new values to the small for loop. Right? Because this value is changing here for every iteration. In turn, that this one will change as well because this is linked to it. This is value and this is value. And this is why we printed John Mr. Hamshaw 27 and 29 in this order. At this stage, you are not a beginner programmer anymore. Now you are in the intermediate level, meaning that everything you will learn from this point on will be more challenging and exciting. Right now, you will be separated from an absolute beginner programmer, so congratulations. This section is all about preventing your program from crashing, meaning that you will do your best to catch any errors before they happen and ruin the user experience of the software that you have designed. This section is called exceptions and no company will ever hire you without knowing how to integrate those concepts into their software because they are key to smooth user experience. So let's get started. Hello guys and welcome back. In this section, we are going to be talking about exceptions. Now, exceptions are used whenever we have a large error that is that will cause our program to crash. Okay, let me give you a very, very simplified example. If I am to create a variable that equals zero, and to create a variable here that equals 2. Now, let's say that I would like to say C is equal to A plus B. Okay, and then I would like to print C. If I do that, I would get a result of 2. Now, imagine changing the operation here to B divided by A. Dividing a number by 0 is an undefined operation, and it causes your program to crash if you try to execute it. Assume that you have a large program and it encounters a case where it has to divide two numbers and for some unexpected reason, this number became zero for some reason. Now the program is going to crash and it's going to exit. This is not a really good practice. Whenever you have division operations, you always want to check for situations where you are dividing by zero. Once you check for a situation where you are dividing by zero, you can actually prevent it. This is the role of exception. Now, let us try to solve this issue here in this line. What we could do is use a statement which is called try and accept. Try and accept. Okay? Try will try to do something to see if we are going to get a crashing error, okay? It could be a file that is not found. It could be a path that is not found. It could be creating a folder using Python where the folder is already exist. All of these situations, which we will see while we are progressing in this course, all of these situations will cause your program to crash. 
So this is why all those sensitive statements, you just put them in a try block. Now, let's say here C is equal B divided by A. It's going to try to do this operation. However, if we get any crashing reason, we are going to go to the accept block. Okay? In this case, we are going to say print. This is not possible. And then I would like the program to continue. Okay? Let's say that here the program is doing C is equal B times B, print C. It's, it's doing stuff. Okay? Now, if I am to execute this, I'm going to see here that this is not possible. Okay? And the program continues to execute without any issue. So, always whenever I have a crashing issue, I can prevent it or even fix it somehow and then continue executing. Now, let's say here that I have other operations, the same ones, and I try to execute them here. I will be stuck at this statement here and the program will not progress and it will crash. But here we are catching, this is called catching, we are catching this exception and then we are continuing as usual. So this is the whole intuition behind try except. In Python, there are exception types. Right now, what we have catched here is called zero division error exception. In order to distinguish it between different exceptions, like let's say name error, we need to specify this right here. So we need to say zero division error. Okay? Why I am specifying this? Because there are other types of exceptions as well. Let's say, just for example, that here I am trying to divide C is equal B divided by X and X is not defined anywhere. This is called a name error because the variable is not defined. You might ask, where would I be in a situation where I won't be defining a variable and using it? There is tons of examples, especially when you are working with more complex structure like object-oriented programming. Sometimes you want to create an object or a variable, you can think about it like that, only in a certain cases. So if these certain cases are not met, this variable won't be created. And sometimes in your code, you might want to use that is not yet created. And in these cases, you would like to catch these issues by catching name error. We will demonstrate name error later, but for now, Let's talk about this zero division error. Now we have specified that I would like to catch this zero division error specifically. Okay? So if I execute this, we catched it in except. Zero division error was catched, and here this is not best possible, it's catched. Now assume that I said here I want to catch name error. And I execute this. As you can see, we did not catch division by zero because here we were only trying to catch if we are dividing by zero, okay? So it's really important as much as possible that you specify exactly what you are trying to catch, okay? Now, if you go to the Python documentation and type exceptions, let's do that together. Let's say Python exception list, for example and we go into built-in exceptions, we go all the way down here, we will see all types of exceptions that Python supports, and there is a lot of them. There is one of them that's called file exist error. When we will be talking about OS library, we will be using these exceptions. When we try to create a folder, for example, and this folder already exists, or this file already exists, we are going to get exceptions like those. File does not exist, file not found, file exist error, file not found error. I mean, you can read those and actually see what does Python support. Now, let's talk about the name error. Let's say that we have here A is equal to 10, B is equal to 2, and then I try to say C is equal to A divided by X. Okay? Now, 
naturally when I execute this, I'm going to say, hey, name x is not defined. Now, simply if I say try, and then here I say accept, and then I say name error, okay, and print variable is not yet variable is not yet created you'll see that i'm not crashing anymore we can continue here the program let's say c equals b times b print c the program will continue as expected so now it goes on like that it's all the same you type what type of exception you want to catch and you catch it or you can just try to catch a general exception this works as well but it's important to know the type. Why am I emphasizing the type? Because you want to know how to handle this exception, right? Let's say here that you know that you are dividing by zero. Maybe in this case, all you need to do is jump with the program to a different place, right? Like instead of dividing B divided by A, you can just bring another variable that you would like to divide in such cases, right? Because of course, in the logic of your program, of your software, you already know what is the second case if this case does not work, right? Maybe you would like to initialize A with 1 in that case. So let's say here, except division equals 0, you would say A is equals 1. Then here you would say uh, something like C is equal B divided by A. And then you would like to print C. So if we continue and remove this statement, for example, You'll see that now the program continue executing with a different A value. Okay, of course we need to execute this first. Of course we need to specify here initially that A is equal to 0 and B is equal to 2. Now if I execute it, you'll see that we got this is not possible and we found a different way to execute it. This is why I'm telling you, you need to know the exception type to know how to handle it. Let's say here, if the variable does not exist, maybe you would like to jump with the program to a different place. Maybe you would like to bring in a different variable, like let's say i is equal to 3. And here you would say, hey, in this case, if x is not yet created, I would like to say c is equal to a divided by i. Okay? And then you would like to just continue. And you continued with the program, but with a different branching. Now we are going to learn how to use the else keyword with exception, okay? I'm going to copy this whole program one more time and just put it here. Right now, we are checking if the variable exists. If the variable does not exist, I would like to divide it by i. However, assume that the variable already exists and I did not go to accept, all right? I would say else, I would like to do something x is equal to 100 okay and here i would like to print x later all right now if we try to execute this program we will be getting an exception that variable is not yet created okay now assume that i already have x so x is equal to 5 all right now i would like to try to divide this t a by x it will be successful and then i would like to assign x to be 100 so if i execute this i will get 100 what i'm saying here is try will try to execute all right if it's successful it means the else need to be executed if try is not successful except will be executed see that again try to execute this if it works jump to else and execute it Otherwise, just execute this statement. This is how except else works. What you can do here, maybe you are trying to create a folder. And here you're saying, hey, try to create this folder for me. If this folder exists, then just don't create it. You don't have to. Otherwise, if the folder does not exist, I would like you to put a bunch of files inside that certain folder. Okay, this is how we use it. Now, I'm going to copy this whole program again, put it here. There is a keyword that is called finally. All right, 
This finally will be executed regardless if you execute it except or else. It's like a compulsory block that will be executed no matter what. So here I'm going to be printing print I will be executed no matter what. Now if I execute this program, you'll see that x was already there, so we went to else and then we jumped to finally. Let's say that x does not exist and I try to execute it. We need to reset this program because Jupyter Notebook actually stores variables, so you need to reset it. And then try to execute this one more time. You'll see here that we executed except variable is not yet created and we executed the finally block. All right. So again, this is when we are working with folder management. This could be very useful. Let me give you a pseudocode about that because we did not yet dig into folder management. I would like to give you a pseudocode example. Let's say here that I want to create a folder that contains five files. All right. Now there is a chance that this folder is already created all right by a previous program run all right let's assume that this program can run multiple times all right so you run it the first time you create that folder you put the files in now you are trying to run the program one more time well the folder is already there what's gonna happen this is what we're gonna do try now I'm going to just use a print here. I am creating, no, I am trying to create a folder. All right. Then here I'm going to say except I'm going to print folder does exist, cannot be created. In this case, I could jump to finally. And just say print folder created successfully. All right, because we already have the folder and it's already created. Now, if the folder does not exist, I'm going to say else print put five files in that folder. Okay, and this is how we create. A folder and this is it this is how we could be used this logic with directory and files management we are trying to create a folder we we cannot really come here directly and try to put all the five files because first I want to make sure that the folder does not exist if it does exist I'm done I'm gonna just jump to finally all right if it does not exist it means that here it will be already created and then I'm ready to put all the five files in. And then I can print folder here. Folder created successfully. Now if I run this, you'll see that I'm trying to create a folder. Then folder does not exist. Put five files in that folder. Folder created successfully. Okay. This sums up how we can use try except else finally in a practical way. If you notice here, we are not printing the type of the exception. We are only printing the type of exception when we have already crashed. Like here, it says zero deficient error. But let's say here, if I remove this and just say except, I won't really know what is the type of error that I have. I am only printing this is not possible. How can I actually print what is the actual exception that I am getting without actually crashing the program. Now the way to do that is as follows. Let's take this example. We are trying to divide by A. I am removing this exception zero. And I'm gonna say exception as E. I'm gonna reset my environment. Now simply if I print E I will get the type of exception I'm having without actually crashing. 
Sometimes this is useful if you want to hold your program and actually print in a pop-up message maybe why are we crashing and then closing the program but you are closing it on your own terms like let's say you have a GUI which we'll be talking about later like a windowed type of program and then you try to divide by zero let's say that you don't want to do anything because you cannot do anything and you should crash at least you will be sending a pop-up to the user saying that you are dividing by zero sorry we will be crashing and then you crash the program instead of the python code actually crashing on its own not generating any errors to the user and just disappearing right so sometimes it's important to get the name of the exception just to show it right like right here let's say that i am dividing by x you'll see that name x is not defined all right you could show this to the user for example let's assume that we have a case where multiple exceptions can happen at the same time okay let's go back to our very simplified example let's say a is equal to zero b is equal to five all right let's try to divide them c is equal to b divided by a so far we have no problem let's say that i would like to catch if a does not exist let's say that there is a possibility of division by zero but at the same time there is a possibility that a is not really defined then how should we take this priority how should we arrange it we can actually type multiple exceptions under each other so here i could say except what do you think is a priority here the variable does not exist or division by zero of course if, the, if, if a variable does not exist i cannot in the first place assume that it is zero and divide it right so priority here is name error i want to make sure that my variable does exist i'm going to print here variable does not exist and then i'm gonna say print creating variable maybe and then he will i will say a is equal to zero a is equal to one maybe and then i will say c is equal to b divided by a all right this is the first one next let's say that for some reason a is still zero so here i'm going to say except zero division error we're going to print cannot be divided by zero then let's print that we are correcting this adjusting value and then we are going to say a is equal to one and c is equal to b divided by a all right let's say that maybe the error here the the error here cannot be known for any reason then we would like to close the horror program in a friendly way so i would say here except exception as e and then just print e and then just print sorry but an error occurred and then we will say exiting all right now let's put an else here and just print c like that this should be okay so first we make sure that a is defined then we make sure that a is not zero then we make sure that there isn't any other errors then we print c let's execute this as you can see here we said cannot be divided by zero adjusting value all right this is correct because a is zero let's say that a is not created you need to reset jupyter notebook and try to run again you'll see that variable does not exist creating variable that's good now let's say a is a string equaling zero let's see what could happen as you can see now we caught an error that we did not actually take account of which is that a is a string and here it is an unsupported operand type integer and string 
So we will be saying sorry, but an error occurred, exiting. So this is how we prioritize our exceptions according to the situation. So try except need a little bit of thinking before coding. It totally depends on the problem you are trying to solve, on the way you are coding. So you really need to think it through. And this is one of the first things that actually testing engineers try to do when they are testing your software. Usually developers will be writing code and testers will try to crash it. So in order to create a solid software, you always need to make use of the try except blocks. Otherwise, the testers can break your code and then they will give it back to you to fix it because they found bugs in it. Here, this is what bugs is actually. When you have an unexpected behavior in your code and you did not really think about handling it. Okay, now let's get a little bit more advanced in exceptions. Sometimes we would like to create our own exceptions to use them in our program. The way to do that is by utilizing a little bit of object-oriented programming, which we have talked about in previous sections. And when we are working with customized exceptions, we would need to write the exception ourselves because the program because Python is not actually programmed to be giving you to raise exceptions that are not built in, right? Because you just added this exception and you need to tell the program that, hey, this case is an exception, so please don't crash it and just generate an exception. Now, let me clarify what I'm talking about in few codes offline. First, let's create a customized exception. I'm going to say here class and call it whatever you want. Let's say customized or just custom exception. All right. Now, this needs to inherit from the class exception built in in Python. So, you, all you need to do is just pass exception. Okay. And say pass here. You don't want to do anything with this class. All right. So, now you have a class built in Python called exception. And you are using this customized exception to inherit this base class. Okay. This is the first step. Now it's time to implement your actual exceptions. We're going to say here class. What kind of exception would we like to do? Let's say if a certain element does not exist in a list, I would like to raise an exception. Let's say that my use case requires such an exception. I'm going to say here element does not exist this is the name of my exception all i need to do now is pass the name of my class here okay meaning inheriting from it which is actually inheriting from exception but i would like to create a class of my own that i would like to inherit from okay you could actually here write directly exception that's totally okay but what i would like to do is to create a class of my own all right so this is the first exception. We're done. All you need to say here is pass. Again, let's create another one. Let's create an exception when my first element is smaller than my second element. Okay. So I'm going to say here first element is smaller than second. All right. And again, we will be inheriting from our customized uh, exception and just say pass. What did I do here? I created two exceptions of my own. That's it. This is how we do it. Now let's use them. Let's say that I have a list that equals one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And I want to raise an exception if number three is not in it. So I'm going to say here, try if not three in L, meaning check L, if three is not in it, I would like to raise an exception. I'm going to say here, raise. This is the keyword. You need to trigger the exception yourself. Now you raise it. Which one? Element does not exist. Meaning we are triggering this exception. Now, after you raise it, you need to catch it. How do we catch it? Like we catch any other exception. We say accept and put the name of this one here in order to take an action. 
let's say the action here is only a print statement that is saying element does not exist raising a an exception all right let me recap we're creating an exception if an element does not exist we have a list we use it try except we are trying if this element does not exist since this is not a built-in exception and we have created it ourselves we need to rise it okay after we rise it we catch it and we do whatever we want as a handling let's try this initially we're not printing anything so let's put an else here maybe and say success element exists and as you can see success element exists now let's remove number three from the list you'll see that we write an exception saying element does not exist raising an exception so this is a customized exception that's good now how about we check if the first element is less than the second element so here we're saying if not three rise an exception we can continue we can say elif l0 is less than l1 then i would like to rise another exception which is this one i'm going to say here rise this exception and what do we do after rising we catch it so we'll say accept this is the exception name print first element is smaller rising and okay now let's execute this you'll see that we tried the first one and we accepted so we just said hey element does not exist there is no need to execute the second one now let's say that three is there we will see that we raised this exception because first element is smaller than the second element and well we did not print the succession we did not print the successful operation message okay so this covers all the important aspects about exceptions this very small section will walk you through some Python built-in functions. You'll see those function a lot when you are reading professional code written by professional developers. The lambda function, for example, is similar to a regular function, but you don't really have to define them outside of the main. They are just defined on the fly, maybe inside the loop. So let's have a look. Okay, so now I will be talking about something called Lambda Functions. We have talked about functions before, but what is a Lambda Function? Well, usually we would define a function like this. We would say def, let's say the function is called x, and then we will be passing some parameters to it. And then here we have some logic, right? and maybe a return value so this is what a usual normal function is now a lambda function can be initialized as follows you would say lambda and then you need to give an argument or the parameter and then you would give the expression okay so what does this mean argument correspond to the parameters here we are passing to the function and an expression is actually whatever we write right here we don't need to do the diff we don't need to we can create this within our program our main program maybe what do i mean by that let us take an example if i simply create a variable here called x and let's say that x will be holding a lambda function so here I would be saying lambda, we, as we said, we need lambda, argument, and expression. Okay, let's say we are passing x to this lambda function. Now it's time to say the expression. What would we like to do with this x? Well, maybe I want to return x divided by 10. Okay, 
Now, simply if I say print x 100 or 50, okay? Now, if I run this, you'll see that I got 5. So, this is a lambda expression. The equivalent way to do that is just by saying, hey, define, let's say, xx instead of x. And here we will be passing a parameter to it, and then we will be saying return parameter divided by 10. Okay, so now if I pass xx here, I will be getting the same result. So this is a normal function, and this is a lambda function. You might ask, why is this useful? It will be useful when we are talking about maps, when we are talking about filters, sometimes in list comprehensions, we will be taking some examples that you would see around when you are reading Python code. Because Lambda is one of the important features in Python, and it's important to learn it, so let's dig into some more realistic examples. Okay, so right now we will be talking about maps and filters which come hand in hand with lambda functions. So, this lecture is about lambda, filters, or filter function, and map function. Alright? We have talked about lambda. Now, what is filter? Filter is actually a function that takes the following. It takes a function as an argument and it takes a list. And it is going to filter this list according to some criteria and according to the rules of the functions we are providing. What do I mean by that? Usually, let's say that you have a list and it contains uh, characters. Some of them are empty. And some of them contains letters, maybe. And let's say you would like to get rid of all the empty entries right here. See, this is an empty string that we don't need. And this happens a lot, actually, when you work with text processing. So how would we filter this? We could use for loops, right, to iterate over this list, check if there's an empty entry in the list. This could be done, but we can do this, actually, in a way more simple way using lambda and filters. So since filter takes a function, it only makes sense to use lambda function instead of writing a separate function, right? So maybe we would write a rule like lambda and we pass an argument to it and we say x does not equal to an empty list, okay? We've talked about lambda that it takes an argument and an expression. Right? So we're saying here that, hey, I have a lambda expression and any entry in this list should not be empty, right? Now, let's say this list is maybe called uh, L. So here I would be passing L. And this will be my filter function. As you can see, it took a function and it took a list. Now this is for filter. What about map? Well, map takes the same thing. It takes a function and it takes a list. And it only makes sense that this function would be a lambda. Right? Now map will work on all the elements of your list. See, right here, we were only working on the elements that meets a certain condition, right? So we are filtering out some elements, we are throwing out some elements, we are keeping in some elements depending on this condition. But with map, we will be working on all the elements equally. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that I have a list that is equal to numbers 2, 4, 6 maybe. And let's say that I will write a lambda expression that will multiply everything by 2. Okay, just as an example. So this will be x, x times 2. 
Okay, this is my expression. Now I can pass a list here, which is my L, and I can say, hey, map. So we will be iterating over all the elements and multiplying them by 2 according to my lambda function right here. See? There is tons of applications for maps and filters, which when you are implementing your project, it will only make sense that you replace your for loops with those functions. So we have talked about list comprehension before, which was compressing a for loop if you want to work with lists. Same thing for maps. It is about mapping. If you have a certain array, you can change the whole elements of that array using a lambda function without using for loops. We have talked about filters, which is about filtering out your list according to a certain condition without resolving to for loops. So let us go with some examples now. All right. Let us now code some filters. I'm going to create a list of letters, let's say A, B, C, and I will be having some empty strings, okay, just like this. Let's use filters, so I'm going to say here, filtered list is equal to, what we want to do is call the function filter, and let's have a lambda x we will pass it an x parameter and we are going to say x so we are going to append to that filtered list all the elements of l only when x does not equal to an empty string okay now remember filter takes a function which is the lambda function and it takes a list to filter it so it is the l now let's try to print filtered list and let's run it we will see that we got filter object why did we get that well because what filter returns here is just the address if you want to convert this to a list you need to encapsulate it in and cast it into a list okay so right now after we cast it and we print we will see that we got abc without all the spaces so this is how a lambda function works. Now, let us append uh, the letter, let's say maybe x, to all the entries of this list. If we want to modify everything in a list, we use map function. So we're going to say append list. This is, as, this is my new list. It will be map. And again, lambda. We will pass it an x parameter. And we will say x plus, let's append the letter d, okay? Let's not append x, let's append d. And then we need to pass it a list, which is l. Now let us print this append list. And we, again, we will be getting map object at a certain address. So again, we need to cast this to a list and print. You'll see that now all the entries of the list are appended the D letter. All right. So this is how map and filter works. And as I said, whenever you are programming in Python, you're going to have scenarios where you will be using for loops. So try to think about it. Can you make a shortcut by converting it to a filter, to a map? Or to a list comprehension always take these into consideration because this is the pythonic way of using for loops okay and the regular for loops are not really the pythonic way sometimes it's important to use for loops in some scenarios but sometimes we can really take a shortcut and resolve to these techniques that we have learned This section is the key to professional coding. Any library that you see around Python is definitely using the concepts that are called object-oriented programming. Your code will be treated like an object that has its own variables and functions. 
that nobody but this certain object can use. Does this sound complicated? Well, it's not really that complicated because I'm going to be breaking those information into very small chunks that you can comprehend. And please don't hesitate asking me any questions in the Q&A section if there is something that you don't get. I will be more than happy to help you through it. Now we are going to talk about a new topic, which is object oriented and programming. What's this? Sometimes you will see it called OOP. This is a really exciting topic and it really makes your code clean. It shows a professionalism and it shows extendability of your code. And it shows that you know what you are really doing because all companies out there, when they're writing a large code, they would be using techniques with object-oriented programming. Okay, so I'm going to try to simplify this to you as much as possible. Let's assume that we have a very small motor, you know, just a motor. And as you know, this motor could be for a car, this motor could be actually for a washing machine, it could be for a refrigerator, it could be for a blender, for anything. Now, a motor can either rotate clockwise or anti-clockwise, all right? And this motor has something to control its speed, okay? So you can easily change the speed of mo this motor and rise it up, okay? So this is a speed, this is time. You can just simply increase the speed, as you can see it's going up, of this motor. So this is motor control. So what are the main functions we collected right now for this motor? One, turn it on. Two, turn it off. Three, rotate clockwise, which is part of the on as well, right? And four, rotate anti clockwise. And number five is change speed. Okay. So we have five functions. What does this even have to do with object-oriented programming? I'm going to tell you in a second. Let me give you a clean page. Now we are going to create something called the class. This class has two main things. One of them is called property. And it's just a fancy name for a variable. Don't get too confused. Next is methods. And just so that you don't get confused, this functions. Okay? So it has its own functions and its own variables. So let's say we have a class called motor. This motor can have properties like on button. It could have something like an off button. It could have something like switch direction button and maybe it has a function to change a speed or a method because maybe changing the speed needs to be a little bit special right okay so right now we have this class for our motor this is a general class now, let's say that I have multiple motors I'm trying to control from my program, okay? As simple as that. Let's say I have a washing machine motor. Let's say that I have a mixer, a blender motor. And let's say that I have a fan motor, something simple, okay? Now, instead of writing the functionality of 
every single one of these and calling functions and calling and creating multiple variables. Now, this class is like a type. You know how we have types like lists and dictionaries? Well, we can have types with the classes. So we're going to say motor, like create me a new motor. And this motor is going to be a mixer motor. And create me another motor. And this time this is a fan motor. Okay. And let's say I want to turn on the mixer. Okay. If I want to turn on a mixer, all I need to say is now mixer motor dot on button for example equals true and I'm done I did not define any on buttons I did not define any extra off buttons let's say I want to turn on the fan motor all I need to say is uh, fan motor dot on button equals a true that's it see how simple is that now I don't need to write multiple variables I don't need to do anything I just define one object by the way this is called object you know we were saying object oriented programming this right here is an object this is an object from the class that is called motor okay so this is object oriented programming I have summarized to you now the most important aspects of object oriented programming which is classes and objects and methods which are functions again and properties which are variables now let's go and implement it in a code all right now we are ready to start with object oriented programming so as i mentioned we need to create something called a class and this class is going to be called motor now we need to define something called constructor okay so this constructor can help us initialize this class we'll talk about that in a minute so the way to do that is by saying diff double underscore in it double underscore initially i'm gonna leave it empty so if i just type pass it means that i have a constructor but it won't do anything i'm gonna leave it as like that now as i said we're going to have multiple functions one of them is called turn on what will this do it will turn on the motor also i'm gonna leave initially everything empty okay so initially i just need to print something like motor is on just to debug i'm not gonna do any functionality yet next def turn off again i'm just gonna be printing motor is off okay now i know in the examples i did not create those turn on and turn off functions when i was explaining and i created them as a variable actually we will be creating a variable for the status of on off but the one that will do the on and off are functions or methods as they are called in object oriented programming next is the speed so we have change speed and simply speed changed And finally, change direction. Change rotation direction. And again, we're going to say print direction changed. Okay, so this is how we create a very simple class. Now, if I try and compile this, nothing will happen. Now, let us create a new fan motor I'm gonna say fan is equal to motor now fan is an object from the class motor and it has all its properties so simply if I say fan dot turn on 
like that and I hit on run I would get a type error at the init well there is the thing that I want you to understand about classes every class need to be passed something called self so even though you're not intending to pass anything to this uh, function or methods around here you need to pass self to them like that now passing self it is in a simple words uh, it's like making all of these functions shareable with this class motor so right now through this definition in it you can access any of those functions through the turn on function you can access any of those other functions now those are not regular functions i mean if for example let me remove this for a second if i say turn on like that and i hit on run i'm gonna get that there is no function called turn on because these functions i are only defined in the scope of this class so in the main function right here there is no access to them unless you do the following unless you create an object from that class and then you can call these functions with respect to that object only this is why self makes all of these functions instances from this class motor in simple words all of these functions can see this class and can see each other once you pass the self and in the Python syntax, you must pass the self keywords to all your methods. Okay, now if we try again, we can see that no errors and we got motor is turned on. That's really great. This is exactly what we are looking for. Now, let's say that I have a new device, a new motor, maybe a washing machine. And all I need to do to create the, the motor for that washing machine is just say motor. That's it. I don't need to create extra functions, variables, nothing. Now, again, I just say, let's say washing machine. I think we have a typo here. Uh, let's say dot uh, change speed, for example. Now, if I just hit on run. Nothing will happen because I forgot the parentheses. Now let's try again. Speed is changed and this speed changed for this washing machine. Now this is really a dull class. We did not create any functionality yet, but I just wanted to make a proof of concept about how classes and objects like fans and washing machine works.
All right, so we are still in object-oriented programming, and right now I would like to talk to you about inheritance. Now, inheritance is a very, very nice concept, and it saves you a lot of code. What does inheritance do exactly? Now, as the name implies, you are inheriting some features. So, for example, let's say that you have created a class for an employee, okay? And this is actually an employee card. The class is for an employee card, okay? You have coded where can this card go? Let's say it can go to the kitchen. You created a method for that. It can go to the printing room where you can print stuff. It can go to the meeting room and etc. It can go to all of those rooms. Now, let's say that you have a manager. Now, of course, managers can have more access to more facilities, right? Let's say you created this class that is called manager and you would like to give different access. Now, it makes sense that the manager will access everything the employee can access. Okay. Okay. But there is additional places where the manager can access it makes sense so instead of rewriting the whole function by saying kitchen printing etc we won't be doing any of that what we're going to do is we are going to inherit all of that employee here so i'm going to say here employee card meaning that i'm going to be passing all the function variables and all the methods to this and I can add more to it. So maybe I can add here a VIP room. So the manager now can access everything the employee can access in addition to a new features. So this is what inheritance is. You take a class that has certain functions, you take all of its functionality, and you can also add to it. You can even override some of the functions here, like to change its functionality. Right? So it saves you a lot of rewriting when you have similar classes. So right now, let us code inheritance. First, I'm going to create a class called employee. And this class, I'm going to create the init function. Just a regular class like before. Pass. And let's create some accesses. Define access meeting room. Pass. Let's leave the functionality for now. Fine. Access to kitchen and access to personal office. Let's add pass to here as well. Okay. Now, let's say that I want to create that employee with higher advantages. So I'm just going to call it advanced employee. The name is ridiculous. Now here, in those parentheses, I would just put the name of the class I want to inherit. So by that, I have inherited employee. Now if I add one more function, let's say access private meeting room. Okay, so let's test this out. If I create an object out of this class, I should be able to access all of these as well. Let's see. So I'm going to say employee number four, let's maybe. And let's say advanced employee. And then I'm going to say employee four dot. Let's see if this employee four will have access to the meeting room. Okay. Now we need some print uh, function just to indicate that we are in this function. So I'm going to print here just the name of every function. This would be better than passes in order to check if we are accessing the function or not. And here as well. 
let's add this this is the name print this as well okay now if i hit on run we forgot to add self to all of those this is why we got an error here so let's add self let's run again and as you can see we can access the meeting room even though we did not define a meeting room in this inherited class okay now we can also access that private room and here we go we have access to the private room that's great now we are going to talk about if we have an initializer here how can we handle it in the inherited class we'll see that we are going to continue with inheritance we are not done yet so let's take the following scenario you have a basic class meaning that class that you would like to inherit from let's call it employee again and we have our inherited class which is called advanced employee now let's say that we have an init function right here And, you know, in the init function, we can create class variables that we can access, right? So let's say it will be something like name, age, initially just these two. Now, we said that the moment we just pass employee like that, we will be inheriting from this class, right? from the base class that we have this is inheritance now every class can have its own in it and let's say i would like to add more variables to those in my inherited class so if i come here and just create a diff a function that is with the same name which is the init as my base class which class will be taken which function will be used is it this one is it this one well the answer is the moment you write a function that has the same name in the basic class you'll be overriding this one you'll be overriding the method or the function in the basic class and you will be using the method in the inherited class so this will win but wait a minute, if I have like eight variables, let's say in here, would I have to rewrite them again, all of them here? Well, you're really not supposed to rewrite everything, right? So there should be a way to do that. And the way is by using the super keyword. Now with the super keyword, if you say super in it like that, what you would do is you are saying I want everything that was in here to be also copied here even though I have the same function the moment I write super and I add the name of my function what I'm doing is I'm taking everything that was inside this init function and I am bringing it here so by that we have overcome the problem of if we override this base function with a different in it what would happen to all the class variables well we can also copy them by adding this super now there is a little bit more into it let's say that you would like to add one more class variable to this inherited one okay so if i expand this a little bit the, these parentheses would have, let's say, a, a new class variable called maybe business number.
Okay. For those advanced employees, I have something called business number. The normal employee does not have this. Well, if I do this, and in my object, when I create an instance from this, from the advanced employee, if I create an instance or an object here, well, and I just try to initialize it with name, age, and business number, I would have a compilation issue. Because even though we have copied this content, these variables right here, to the init, I still did not resolve how can I pass those variables. Remember, I am passing them here, and then I am assigning them here. How can I solve this passing problem? Well, let's do some coding and see how we can tackle this issue. All right, so we have already written this class in the previous tutorial. To, to sum it up, we have an employee, we have a constructor, it's still empty, and we have three uh, access authorization. And in the inherited one, we just added one more authorization for this advanced employee. Okay, now let's add a constructor here. And we are going to say that here we have age, first we need self, then we have age, then we have name and age. And here we are going to create these two. So we need self dot underscore name equals name, right? And self dot underscore age equals age. All right. Now here, let's say we have also a constructor because we have one more information that we would like to add as a class variable. So we are going to say diff in it and simply here we will say self let's say i want to just add one more trade which is business number okay now i told you that you can use super keyword to copy all of these right so we will say super underscore super dot in it okay and by that we have copied everything here but we still have the problem of passing those here okay maybe we have copied those with the super but we're still having a passing problem now if i try to maybe compile this first let me let me uh, get the object so we have employee or no advanced employee which will equal to advanced employee like that maybe just call it a employee all right now let's say i try to pass the three parameters since they are supposedly inherited like uh, john and age maybe 25 and then the business number let's say it is seven eight nine one if I try to run this, I'm going to have issues. It, will, it is saying that it was prepared to take two, but it got four. As you can see, self, it's always considered one, but you don't really pass it. So when you say it was supposed to take two for, for a method in a class, it means that it was supposed to take one, actually, because self is already taken care of. But here it's saying that four were given. So it was expecting only one. That means we did not really copy those to our inherited class. So how can we do that? You can do that simply by doing the following. You need to pass here star arcs and double star quarks. Okay? You need to do that here and also here. Okay? So this what those means in very simple words it means take everything that the init has no matter how many variables are and just copy them here okay same thing here it says take everything here and just copy them here all right now if i try to run this 
Okay, we forgot to add that super is need parentheses as well. So let's try again. As you can see, now we have no errors. Now, if I try to print a employee dot, let's say name, and I just print it, underscore name, we would see we have 25. Now, if we try to print the business number, take a look what's going to happen. Well, it got us the name. Why is that? Because of the order we are passing here. Okay, so here we need to put the new variables at the beginning. So this needs to go here right now. And then we have the regular order that we have over here, which is name age. So whatever new variables you have, you just put them at the beginning. Then you put the others. Okay. Now, if we try to run, you'll see that we have John and the business number. Now, let's try to print the age as well. Okay, we just have an indentation problem. Let's try again. We will see that we got the age. Okay, so these orgs and quarks has many applications. And one of them is just to copy whatever variables you have in your init in the basic class to the inherited class. So this is a very important concept. And I hope that you learned something when you looked at this tutorial. Now, I need you to really try to write a similar application so that you can get your hands busy and maybe you can uh, learn this topic a little bit better because this stuff only are learned with hands-on experience. Okay.